The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. The following program is closed captioned for the thinking impaired. By tomorrow, I will rule the world! Do you think he's gone? He's not gone! That's the whole point! He's never gone! Is this some radical new therapy? You see? Well, I must have never been paying attention when you were just talking. Hey, how, hey, hey, how you doing? Dave LaCroix has joined us. We have a great studio audience. Hi, how you doing? Thanks for joining us. I'm Tom Duggan on the Paying Attention television podcast. I don't know. Is it a television podcast? It's some kind of podcast. Um, You can uh, follow us on the Paying Attention podcast channel on YouTube. Uh, If you want to watch us tape the show live, if you want to watch the uh, post-produced segments, you can go to my YouTube page um, and you can subscribe to my YouTube page. We've got a lot of things to talk about today. We've got a great guest coming in. He's not here yet, but I know he will be. State Representative Lenny Mira from uh, the town of Newberry. And he's um, he just finished writing a book. He just released a book. I didn't know that until after I booked him on the show. Um, and we got an announcement about that that I think is kind of pretty interesting. Uh, but before we get into all that stuff, uh, I know Ira's not here today. Kiana, I don't know why she didn't tell me, but she's not here today either. Um, and uh, somebody else is missing. Who else is missing? Anybody? Oh, all I know is we're here. Yeah, it's Fred and Meredith. There you go. Really, we got a show. Really, that's all that counts as far as I'm concerned. There you go. As long as Meredith is here. I mean, Fred and Meredith are <laughs> Thanks, here. Thanks, Tom. That's, that's, all, that's, that's awesome. all that counts. So why don't you guys tell us what's going on with the news? All right. Well, Tom, we're going to begin today in North Andover, where voters overwhelmingly rejected a proposal to build a marijuana manufacturing and research facility at Osgood Landing. Now, residents packed the North Andover High School gym to discuss plans for the facility at a town meeting, which was held in this past Monday night. After a lengthy debate, they voted to approve a regulation that would ban all recreational marijuana facilities in town by a margin of about 1,400 people to 1,100 people, which effectively killed the proposed project. Now, we talked about this project before on the show. Opponents of the plan worried about the negative effects of having more than uh, 1 million square feet of marijuana research and growth facilities located in the town. Those in favor of the plan, though, argued that it would bring about $100 million of much-needed tax revenue into the community over the next 20 years, while really having few, if any, negative impacts on the town. Now, Tom, I think you were in favor of this project. I was. We talked about it before. What do you have to say about the outcome? Well, I, 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 I was a little surprised by the outcome. Really? I thought North Andover was a little bit bit more progressive yeah um they certainly build themselves as more progressive 1100 people were um, but yeah but, but i think i think the reason you know analyzing it afterwards i think the reason why this failed is because you had a well-funded campaign against it right uh that was filled with lies and deceit now if somebody wants to vote against a marijuana plant or a trash plant or a new police station uh for whatever their reasons are i respect that that's the democrat process and uh if they got up at town meeting and said Look, I'm just a closed-minded individual who doesn't think marijuana should be legal, so I'm voting no. I would respect that. Yep. But instead, they lied. And you had people like Rosemary Schmidili getting up. She actually was the only one I thought that brought up a good point. Um, you had Rosemary Schmidili got up on the other side and said, look, North End of it has a brand, right? North End of it, we're the, we're the town that has sheep sharing and we're the town that does all these, you know, all these great things for veterans. Yep. Uh, you know, we're a sleepy bedroom town, and we don't want to be known as the marijuana town. Right. I, she was the only one that actually made a good point. The rest of them, we had a doctor got up and pulled up a screen with uh, brain scans that showed what happens to a kid's brain and development when they're smoking marijuana. Not relevant. I mean, I mean, you had people arguing as if this was a vote as to whether or not to make marijuana legal or not. And yep. we've already lost that fight. I voted yep. against making marijuana legal. So. You had people saying that the uh, they were going to drain Lake Kachikawik because they're going to need all the water for the cultivation <laughs> of the plants. Right. There's going to be no water left and, and people are going to die of thirst. <laughs> and you had other people saying there's going to be like a drive-up window where teenage yeah. kids can buy their pot in North Andover. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had other people talking about how bad the smell is going to be. It was all just lies. And I just think if you're going to get a vote, get it honestly. And yep. if, if people still vote no, then that's fine. That's, again, the Democrat process. I just don't understand why people have people feel the need to lie. And by the way, most of these people that were on the other side of this are the people that I agree with politically on 99% of what right. goes on in town. Right. Right. I mean, they were all the right wing Tea Party people, the elderly conservative people. I agree with them 99.9% of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I, I, I just I, I just have very serious objections to people friggin' lying. Well, so you what know? do you think happens next here? Because do you think this is the end of the story in terms of this no. facility going in there? No. And then what happens with Altitude Landing? Because if it's not this, if it's not going to be Amazon, wh- what's going to happen there? Right. Well, you know, it's a I, lot of space. I'm pretty sure the gold scenes are going to appeal this in court. Yeah. And at some point, a guy with a black robe is going to be making the decision on this. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it's going to go the way of pornography. Not that they're similar in any way other than... Um, you know, it's this, it's this, as for a zoning situation, right. it's the same thing. You've got to allow it somewhere. You have to allow it somewhere. Yep. Pornography is legal. Um, you have to have uh, in Lawrence. There's a, a by the Falls Bridge. There's a little porn, 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 pornography shop. I don't know how to say yeah. it. Um, and the neighbors fought that like crazy. Right. But if you don't have a zone somewhere for it, then they can go wherever they want. That's right. what the law says. Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty sure this is going to go before a judge. I'm pretty sure it's. It, it, it's the judge is probably going to rule in favor of the marijuana facility, which will make people in town outright furious. Yeah. Um, the one thing I did want to bring up, um, and I, I, I touched on it. I went live before our town meeting to talk about it because I was kind of disgusted by it. A couple of people who were in the no category for the marijuana facility had posted some pretty anti-Semitic, pretty racist things online. Oh, wow. And one of the, one of the guys put, uh, why are we selling the town out for a couple of shekels? Well, shekels are Jewish money, and the Goldsteins are Jewish. They're the people running this project on, yeah. on, on, the, on the pro side. And I think to campaign against something and use someone's Jewish heritage, right. I'm not going to say the person who did it is racist. I mean, I could do a whole rant on that. Uh, liberals teach you, and our college system teaches you, that if someone says something racist, that makes them a racist. I don't yeah. believe that. Yeah. So I don't think the person who said this is necessarily racist. But what he said was certainly racist mm-hmm. and certainly repugnant and needs to be called out. And I probably should have called him out by name, but I didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but but whenever you have a contentious issue, whether it's a Prop 2 and a half override or a new school building or this, you always have a campaign of deceit out there. And that's right. one of the reasons we started the Valley Patriot. I'm just so tired of the fucking lies. Excuse my French. I'm just so tired of it. If you believe in something and you know that you're right, uh-huh. then there's no need to lie. Right. It yep. goes to show that they don't believe that they're right about what they're saying, that they know that there's a that there's a crack in the foundation of their right. position, right. that they have to now turn around and lie. So that's yep. that's my big thing. I mean, I, I sat there and I watched pe- person after person get up at town meeting and talk about how marijuana is evil. It's going to make you smoke crack. It's a gateway drug. It's, yep. it's going to make you beat your wife. Like none of that was true. And. And even if it was, none of it's relevant. It's legal now. Right. Right. This is going to be a medical marijuana facility only for testing, growing, and research. There's going to be no purchasing in North Andover. It was going to be sent out to hospitals and doctors. Um, but you would never know that if you watch town meeting. Right. And I don't. I don't. I'm. I, like I said, I think the only person who made a uh, a legitimate a legitimate case was Rosemary Smedili. As much as I hate to say that, um, she did. But the rest of them. It was just a, it was a misinformation campaign. Right. I wish the voters were a little smarter and they didn't fall for it. Well, if the issue is not over, we will continue to monitor here on paying attention, and we will give updates as they come available. They also gave up five million dollars when they voted no. <laughs> right. Right. They gave up five million dollars. A lot that's, of money. That's a tax. That's a prop two and a half override without raising taxes. Yep. yep. So my suggestion to Phil DiCollegero and Chris Nobili, I think, and I said this live that night, I think tomorrow. They should start a five million dollar override campaign. There you go. Right to raise people's taxes by two and a, by more than two and a half percent. Yep. To cover the loss of the five million dollars from that vote the other night. Right. You watch how quickly people are for a marijuana plant after that. You watch. <laughs> it's all about. They'll them. be over there planting the seeds themselves. <laughs> <laughs> we turn now to the city of Lawrence, where interim police chief Roy Vask received some good news this week. It turns out that violent crime was actually down substantially in the first month of 2018 compared to the same period a year ago. During the month of January, there were no murders or rapes reported in Lawrence. What's more, robberies, burglaries, grand larceny, and auto thefts were all down by 50% or more as compared to January 2017. So what's behind this? Is this real? Is it? I, yeah, you know, it, 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 crime stats in Lawrence have an ebb and flow that's very different from everywhere else. Part of the reason, if you talk to Jeff Riley, who is the superintendent receiver in Lawrence, yep. uh, or Wilfredo LeBoy, the former superintendent, they'll tell you that from like November to the end of February, they see about a one-third reduction in school enrollment because there's a lot of Dominicans in Lawrence who go back to their home country when it gets really cold. <sighs> and so, and they do. My mom was the school nurse at the Frost. She used to tell me all the time, a third of my kids are gone in January. It's quiet in this building. 
Um, they do. They go back to their home country, and we transfer all of their school stuff to the Dominican, and they attend school in the Dominican. Really? Yeah, and then they come wow. back sometime around March when it starts getting nice again. I that. Wow. They don't count them as drop-offs, dropouts, I don't think. <laughs> Um, so I think that's part of it. I think you have fewer people in Lawrence, yeah. yep. and by virtue of having fewer people, you have fewer crime. But I think there's something else going on here, too, and I'm not sure what it is. Mm-hmm. I like having the answer to everything. I don't think I have the answer on this one. Yep. Um, there's a, a whole different way the police are behaving. Um, there's a whole different way that the law enforcement agencies from the state and federal government are behaving in Lawrence. We know the FBI, the DEA, and the ATF have a permanent spot in Lawrence. They've got a location in Lawrence they're working out of. Um, and they've been targeting gang members very, very heavily from like August to like now. Yeah. Um, they've deported quite a few people mm-hmm. um, who had not only warrants here, but warrants in their home country. And I think I think the, the swamp is starting to drain a little bit. The real the real uh, bellwether, the real bell mark will be come April when it's really nice at the beginning of the month, when everybody gets their welfare checks and everybody gets their Social Security checks or whatever they get. That's when you start measuring whether or not the crime is going to go back to where it was last year at this time or yep. whether or not it's significantly lower. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a lot of faith that Chief Vask is going to be able to turn some of these numbers around. He's a Lawrence guy. He grew up in Lawrence. Uh, I went to St. Pat's school with him. Mm-hmm. He was a couple of years behind me. I think he was in Kevin Callahan's class. Um, but he's a no-nonsense guy. Yeah. You know, like you can sit down with him for five minutes and have a conversation with him and you don't have to like go home and figure out what he told right. you. Like right. when you talk to a politician. Yep. Uh, and I, and I, th- I think that I think that's having a really good effect on the way the cops are being able to do their job now. Mm-hmm. So. Well, you know, you talk about Chief Ask. Um, that brings us to our next story because he made a suggestion recently to the Lawrence Licensing Board that they change the regulations about last call, mm-hmm. and those got approved last night. Um, so starting in two weeks, last call is going to take place a half hour before closing time, according to these new regulations. Then 15 minutes prior to closing time. All the lights are going to go off in the establishment. Uh, excuse me, go on in the establishment. Go on. And all forms of entertainment uh, will stop. So uh, by closing time, it'll be 1 a.m., 2 a.m., whatever time it is, all patrons will be completely out of the establishment with the lights on. Let me tell so, you. The fun you, always ends when the lights right, come on. When right. the lights come on, it's all over. <laughs> well, listen, the real fun happens at the after parties anyway, so I don't even know why anybody's even complaining about True. this. Look, the, one of the problems that, the, that the, the cops and the good God-fearing people of Lawrence who aren't criminals have to deal with it, uh, every single weekend is that – Last call will come, and I won't mention any any clubs by name. I've been in clubs when this has yep. happened. Okay, yep. so last call will come. Let's say it's one o'clock. At one o'clock, they start shutting people off, but not really, right? right? And then they lock the doors, so anybody that wants to leave can leave, and nobody else can come in. Mm-hmm. And technically, they weren't in violation. And what was happening was people were staying till two thirty, three thirty inside. Yep. And sometimes people, you know, would have a case of beer in their car that they'd run out and they'd, right. and they'd get, or maybe they'd be serving when they weren't supposed to be serving. Um, though That caused an awful lot of problems because now you've got people who are leaving long after last call that have been drinking, right. un- unmonitored, mm-hmm. they're driving around through the city. I think this is good. Everybody should leave at one o'clock. If it's one o'clock, if last call is at one o'clock, a quarter of one, people should be leaving. Yep. Right? They right. shouldn't be they shouldn't be waiting. They shouldn't be drinking up to twelve fifty nine. Right. right. Last call is last call. Last call That's is it. last call yeah. and that sh- and that should be it. They should finish their drink. And get the hell out. Yep. How do people stay up this late? I'm ready for bed at nine I o'clock. Well, listen, I never sleep, so I'm always it. out there. <laughs> I'd, I'd kill to have your sleep schedule. <laughs> I'd kill for four hours right now, quite <laughs> frankly. Is anybody on that couch right there? <laughs> Rich Rich Russell's taking up my sleeping couch. <laughs> So Lawrence School Superintendent Receiver Jeff Riley received some positive recommendations. He's the best. To become the state's next education commissioner. Yeah, absolutely. We right. predicted that on this show two weeks ago. Yes, you did. Yep. Yep. The State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education voted 8-3 to three to recommend that James Pizer approve Riley to oversee K-12 education across the state. According to officials, Riley's work to narrow the achievement gap and improve test scores while serving as receiver for the Lawrence School since 2012 were critical factors in the decision. So, Tom, what do you think about Riley's selection? Well, I, it doesn't surprise me. I've talked to Charlie Baker a couple of times about Jeff Riley. Uh, when he first got here, we, I had a very wrong impression of him. Mm-hmm. Um, I was under the impression that he was a, kind of like a left-wing ideologue that was here to kind of uh, indoctrinate our kids. Because mm-hmm. the state put him in charge, and look who runs the state. It's the left-wing Democrats, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, boy, was I wrong about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, he came in, and he, he kicked the, uh, the teachers' union in the ass on his very first day. Uh, I suspect that's the reason why he left. Yep. Um, he, he has turned some things around, um, some things that he hasn't been able to turn around. I think he um, 
He ran into a lot of political roadblocks by Dan Rivera. Dan Rivera tied his hands on some things. Um, at the end of the day, having a guy who has worked as a superintendent in Lawrence be the chairman of the Education Commission in Massachusetts is tremendously helpful to communities like Lawrence, yep. Haverhill, Springfield, Holyoke, because it's not about abstract ideology in his head now. He's right. not governing based on what he learned in college. Right, right? right. He's mm -hmm. governing based on real life experience and what he's seen and what he's experienced. And I think that's going to make him an excellent uh, education commissioner. I just hope he keeps spending money with us. Right. I hope not. I mean, <laughs> we'll he see. bought a lot of ads when he was superintendent. I hope he there keeps doing that as commissioner. <laughs> they hire a lot of people, but put those notices in the Valley Patriot. Right. Tom, let's talk national politics for a minute. So President Trump uh, delivered... Love him. Well, I'm going to ask you about that Love in a second. Him. There you go. He delivered his annual State of Half the Union address to Congress. <laughs> <laughs> he delivered his State of the Union address to Congress on Tuesday night. Uh, the speech lasted about 90 minutes in length, and he addressed a number of issues, including the ongoing disagreement over immigration that's going on in Congress right now and escalating tensions with North Korea. He also listed a number of accomplishments during his the first um, year of his term, most notably efforts to cut taxes for American families and businesses. Now, there were certainly many critics of the president and his address, as, as usual, but many praised him for delivering delivering a speech that featured an upbeat tone and signaled a willingness to work with Republicans and Democrats in Congress constructively. So, Tom, did you see the speech? I started at 2.30 in the morning. There you go. What would you think? Um, I liked it. Yep. Uh, I, I, w I wished it was a little less rehearsed, but it can't be. It's a State of the Union speech. Right, right. Um, I, what was more interesting to me was how the, how the seditious media – and they're not news media anymore. They're really entertainment media. Seeing yeah. really, they're actors. They're not reporters. Mm -hmm. uh, how they reacted afterwards, it was like, well, yeah, he kind of did a good thing, but he's a racist. <laughs> he's a Nazi. He's a he's a communist. He's a and I don't even know how you can be a Nazi and a communist. Like, <laughs> on the one hand, he's a right wing Nazi who who is who hates black people and wants to kill Jews, and then on the other hand, he's a left wing communist spy for Vladimir mm -hmm. Putin's Russia. Like I don't know how like how you square those two, but somehow with a straight face CNN does it every day. Well so break it down for us. He's been in office about a year now. Yep. What do you think? Well look I I um I'm the only employee at the Valley Patriot. Everybody else gets 1099. Yeah. Uh, when I was working out what my gross versus net pay was this week on right. Monday, yeah. I got like a hundred and twenty dollar uh, raise in my pay go. because my taxes are $120 less now. Wonderful thing. Because of so th the news media and the Democrats, which is really all the same, they can run around and they can cry, Donald Trump says mean things, Donald Trump's a racist, Donald Trump says Haiti is a shithole, and they can talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. But at the end of the day, if people are cashing their check, they got an extra 120 bucks in their pocket. Yep. They're not going to give two shits whether Donald Trump hurt somebody's little feelings and say global warming wasn't real or that Haiti's a shithole country. They're not going to care. And they shouldn't care. You know, the difference between conservatives and liberals, there's a lot of differences, but one of the main differences is that liberals tend to care more about what you say and conservatives care more about, generally care more about what you do. Right. right. And so I think a lot of, like, people on the left look at those of us who support Trump and go, how is it possible that anybody could support this guy after what right. he says? And the answer is, we don't care what he says. If he builds a wall, if he lowers my taxes, if he if he reforms the VA so our veterans are getting taken care of, mm -hmm. I don't I don't care who he insults. Right. That's why he got in? You know, he can insult yep. China. He can insult my mother. I really couldn't care less. Like really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, do we govern by feelings or do we govern by actions? Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the one of the big one of the big chasms. I don't know if you guys watched um, Tucker Carlson last night. It's one, it's one of the I only shows on it. Fox that I watched. Yeah. He had a guy on that was liberal, and every time he said something, the liberal guy would talk over him and accuse him of attacking his family and attacking black people and attacking this and attacking that. And it made me realize that you know, we can't talk to each other anymore, conservatives and liberals, because we're not hearing what the other person is saying. Right. We're hearing something else. Right. Yep. You know? So, I mean, if I want to talk about why we need to build a wall, a liberal's not hearing, well, mm -hmm. you know, we need to secure our borders and we need to have a secure country. They're hearing racism, 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 right. racism right. because they've been brainwashed. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost impossible to, to bridge this gap between liberals and conservatives and go back to the way it was even 10 years ago where you right. could agree to disagree. Yep. Right. You know, like I have people literally come on my Facebook page, beg me to accept their friend request because I've mm -hmm. got, you know, I'm topped out. So when I have an opening, I, right. I, I who's been waiting the longest? 
Um, they'll come on, I'll accept them, and they'll see like one comment where I said Donald Trump was right about something, right. and I'll get this three paragraph instant message about how I'm a right wing fascist, and 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 they're blocking me on Facebook, and they don't want to listen to anything I have to say, and they're never reading my newspaper again. There's nothing you can do about that. Right. right. If I say blue and you hear pink, there's nothing I can do right. about that. Yep. Right. And there's no way we can come to any kind of an agreement. We've really got to go back to treating people as individuals, mm -hmm. listening to what they say, and stop questioning their motives when they say something. How about ask them, did you mean to say yeah. that all black people in Haiti are, are, are bad people? And then if he says yes, then fine, call him a racist all you want. Yeah. But how about let's just talk to each other? Right. right. Uh, I, think, I think Trump has, has made it harder for that to happen because right. he's mm -hmm. so explosive in the yep. things that he says. Yeah. But maybe that's what we need. Maybe we need to shake the narrative a little bit. And maybe that's how we're going to get people to start talking to each other. Well said. I well like said. that. Thank yeah. you. There you go. <laughs> Meredith likes me. <laughs> So this week was a mixed bag for the all-Democrat mass congressional delegation. Congressman Joe Kennedy III was the beneficiary of some high-profile attention Tuesday night as he got to deliver the Democratic Party's response to President Trump's State of the Union address. It's a high honor for a person to be selected by his or her party to deliver a response to the President's address to Congress, and it's widely recognized as a responsibility given to someone who's a rising star politically, although it's also considered to be a little bit of a curse, like being on Sports Illustrated. Right, right, yep. Can, anybody, can anybody see... Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, Rubio, right, right. What's his first name? Mar Marco. Marco. Marco Rubio. Remember with the water? That yeah. was the end well, of him. Well, Kennedy yeah. supposedly he right. had a little bit of wetness right here, so right. it was people thought it was drool, chapstick. No one knows. But. See, I, I I saw that they had Kennedy come out to do the Democrat response, which, by the way, I don't think there should be a response. Right. Even when Obama was president, when Obama was president, and then the Republicans would come out and say the opposite of everything he said. Mm -hmm. It's like, look, dude, you're not president. Right. right. The president gets to give a State of the Union speech. Yep. You're not the president. There shouldn't be a an opposition. I don't think there should be right. an opposition response. Right. Yep. But when I saw Kennedy, I was thrilled. I was thrilled because it's an indication that the Democrats still don't friggin' get it. Right. I mean, who was their candidate for president? An old rehashed hack, Hillary Clinton. Right. And so now they're grooming people to come up in the Democrat Party. And who are they grooming? Another old name Kennedy hack. Right. I mean, this this guy's only in this business because of his family name. Right. And he's just spouting the same talking points that you get on CNN every day. Everything's about abstract issues. Nothing's concrete. Right. right. It's about racism and global warming and hurting people's feelings. And he didn't say anything. Right. And I was thrilled. Like most, most conservatives were watching it and they were cringing. I was thrilled. I'm like, look, Democrats still don't get it. Trump's going to get four more years. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Meanwhile, one mass congressman had less good fortune this week. He drew a, pr a high-profile Democratic primary challenger this fall. Boston City Councilor Ayanna Presley announced she will challenge Rep. Mike Capuano in the 7th District. That district includes portions of Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville. Presley said her decision to run is based on a need for someone to be an effective advocate and champion for the people of the district. That primary schedule for September 4th. Thoughts on that? Um, no, because I, I was uh, daydreaming through most of it. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just being honest. Who's running? Well, who's running? So and that's Boston, the news. <laughs> so Boston City Councilor Ayanna Presley challenging the incumbent Democrat, someone her own party. Mike Capuano has been in Congress a long time. Oh, I she's mean, running against Mike? Yeah. Running against Mike. Mike. No, we got to support Mike. Mike's the best. Well, that's not what she says. Yeah, I know. But look, I've interviewed Mike. Mike is awesome. Mike's one of those guys where you go over to him with a camera and you start asking him questions. Mm -hmm. And he just – he's like the Democrat Trump. He says whatever's off the top of his head no yeah. matter how outrageous it is. And and that's like real. I think one of the reasons he keeps getting reelected is he doesn't do the talking point bullshit. Mm -hmm. He actually answers questions. But so what do you think it says of the, about the fact that uh, – Fairly high profile and no successful Boston City Councilor Ayanna Presley is choosing to run against him. He's, he hasn't said he's leaving office or anything right. like that. That's a challenge. Yeah. So. Well, it, it, she's probably much more liberal than he is. Mm -hmm. She's probably a progressive. Yep. Um, and and my cup one is pretty progressive, but he doesn't check all the boxes, right? Mm -hmm. He checks 99 of the 100 boxes. That makes him a traitor to the Democrat Party, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're not 100% with us, you're the enemy. Right. You know, so I don't know. I think in that one, I got to support uh, Mike Capuano. I might even write him a check. There you go. <laughs> You'll we, take it. For $120. Right, yeah. Yes. Right, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. There you go. Tom, that's your news. No, that can't be it. That's it? That's all there is to news? I'm talking about it. for that? Wow. Well, at least I get to see Meredith. That's, <laughs> there you go. That's something good. So, all right. Excellent. So now, um, we're going to, we haven't announced it yet, but we're going to, starting today, we're doing two hours. 
So we got another advertiser. We got Adam Auto Body in uh, South Broadway and Lawrence. We appreciate them Excellent. coming on board as a sponsor of the program. So starting today, we're going to do two hours, which means we can do longer breaks, yep. which means we're way more prepared when we come back, which is awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and and you guys can do much longer news. So starting awesome. next week, we can start bringing in video clips Excellent. to run while we're doing news, and we can run and bring in some more uh, some more graphics. That's exciting. Good. That's great. So why don't you guys promote your business and tell people who you are and, and why I actually have you here. Well, uh, I don't know why you have us here, but, you know, uh, we have... <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, you yes, know exactly uh, I know, why I have uh, Well, you. I got to, you know, get straight here. Uh, we are co-founders and partners at Lyric Consulting, which is a public relations and marketing firm for businesses and political candidates based in the Merrimack Valley. We also have our own real estate brokerage lyric properties based in, in the merrimack valley as well and i'm an attorney by trade so basically we got you covered no matter what you need right we're there and i heard we're you there. took on a new client recently uh we don't talk about our clients okay. except for the valley patriot <laughs> right, but well, that's we what take I'm, on many that's where I was going. there you go but that's i appreciate I that yeah. uh and strong supporters of the valley patriot and everything it does we appreciate that so, so if you want to book me for a book signing right. or you want me to speak at your college or you you want you need uh you need to talk to your law enforcement group you don't call me anymore call fred and meredith they're gonna that's be right. my, my new booking agent that's our new client it's uh yeah it's, well, that's that's where i was going there. all right oh well i thought you meant another one yeah, we'll so. see when he sits next to so meredith, many new clients <laughs> any guy that sits next and Meredith gets tongue tied because just look at him. If you want to find Tom Duggan, we know where he is. Yep, we absolutely. can book him. He's available. Yep. Let us know. He's yeah. a good speaker. Just don't follow me while I'm driving around Lawrence. No, it don't do that. Doesn't work out well for <laughs> Much you. Much better. As that guy last night. As yep. that guy last night found out. There you Where's go. Mike Thibodeau? Mike Thibodeau, did you, did you follow that last night? He's talking to Sean the Barista. We go. lost him. All right, listen, let's take a quick break. I appreciate right. you guys being here. We're going to extend your news. I hope you guys like that idea. That sounds great. I didn't run it by you. I just kind of made the decision by myself. It's kind of what I do. Uh, the Valley Patriot will be out next Tuesday. We're on deadline now. So if you'd like to advertise with us, please give us a call or call Fred and Meredith. Yeah, don't call me. No. The fewer people that call me, the better. Right. I can't dial out. I can't call anybody back because I'm on the phone working two phones all day. Yeah. All right, kids. We'll be back after this. I'm paying attention where everybody except Colonel Sam Poulton gets it. Let's get back to paying attention. And once again, 
Here's your host, Tom Duggan. That's what they tell me. All right, studio audience, we don't clap anymore when we come back from breaks. Is that what I mean? I gotta train you guys all over again? What is that all about? Sean the Barista! <laughs> awesome, thank you, Sean. Sean, say hi to everybody at home. Hi to everybody at home. Thank you for being our, we have, we have our own barista here at the uh, Studio 21 Podcast Cafe in Salem, New Hampshire, above Two Guys Smoke Shop. Uh, and at the top of the show, I did not thank our sponsors. We'll do that now. Uh, we want to thank, uh, who do we have for sponsors? Twin Lights Security. They do my security. We have Mike Thibodeau here keeping me, uh, keeping me safe today. We actually have a couple of security guys here keeping me safe today. Let me try this uh, coffee here. Oh, my God, that is the best damn coffee I've ever had in my life. And I'm not just saying that either. You you guys know me well enough. Um, Twin Light Security and Investigations. They do private investigations. They do security for businesses, security for individuals, as as you know. Um, We also have A&M Auto Parts. Go see Angelo on South Broadway, the corner of South Broadway and Inman Street in Lawrence. Uh, Go see Angelo. If you get a ding in your car, you get into an accident, go down. Tell him that you're a friend of mine. Tell him that you watch this show or that you read the Valley Patriot, and he will take care of you. He'll give you a good discount. Uh, Caruso and and Caruso, attorneys at Law, 68 Main Street in Andover. Um, And who else do you have? Methuen Family Restaurant, Century 21, Team Zingales, EIS Security, Eagle Investigations in Methuen. Uh, let's see. Next week, we're going to have Jeff Riley, the new commissioner of education. I should have mentioned that during news, but I forgot. Um, and sitting to my left is, um, a guy we're going to, I'm going to do like a little bit of rant, but I figured we'd bring him up first. Um, I, I first met Lenny Mera. Lenny Mera is the guy sitting to my left. I first met state representative Lenny Mera during the primary of his first campaign. And there was, I think, three people running, maybe four, if my memory serves. Yep. Uh, there was this tiny little debate going on at a fire station in Groveland. And I got there, and there were like literally like eight people in the audience. There was more people up on stage than there were in the audience. And I watched each of the candidates. And when it got to Lenny, every time it got to Lenny, it was just such no nonsense, no BS. Um, everybody else was spouting conservative talking points and everybody else was talking about, uh, you know, all the hot button issues. And Lenny was just kind of no nonsense, common sense guy, just talking about, you know, just basic things like saving money on roads and lowering the gas tax and not having an automatic gas hike, gas tax hike without a vote in the, in the uh, legislature. And I thought, boy, if this guy wins, he's going to be a real asset in, uh, at the state house. And he is. So I want to welcome you. Thanks for coming Thank on the show. You, Tom. Thank you for having me on the show. Now we're going to have to some on air production. Is that be better? Really close, much better. All much right. Better. So Lenny is a Republican. He represents the town of Newberry and he, um, he's, he's, been at the forefront of quite a few fights in the legislature that affect everyone's life in Massachusetts. But I think before, rather than have me talk about it, because I'll probably screw it up, let's have him talk about it. <laughs> so why don't you talk about some of the stuff that you've been doing lately, and then we'll get to... Uh... Sure. Thank you, Tom. First of all, I love the new digs. Last Thanks. time I was on your show, you were in that old place in Lowell. Yes. With uh, Phil from the Future. Right, yep. Oh, good there guy. were rats running around. Yeah. Meat, meat peeling oh, off. man. Yeah. That was fun. That was this is great. That was at CEP. They haven't, put a, they haven't put a dime of money into that building in like 55 years. Well, this is wonderful. This is all brand new. We want to thank Dave uh, Dave Garofalo from uh, Two Guys Smoke Shop for putting this together for us. Yeah. Well, uh, lately, we're going to uh, State House. We're going to be entering budget season really soon. A uh, very important time. And, you know, the economy in Massachusetts has been doing very well for the last several years. Uh, very low unemployment. Uh, businesses are growing. Uh, the economy is expanding. But you know what, Tom? We never saw a real um, solid increase in tax revenues like we expected. Every year, uh, we would put forth a fairly conservative budget and – uh, instead of having a surplus at the end of the year, we would end up with uh, a slight shortfall. And so we ended up, always ended up with nine seat cuts at the end of the year. Uh, this year, we're thinking that's going to turn around. And um, let's give credit where it's due. I think this new tax plan down in Washington is going to have a large part of that. I think we're going to finally see the economy grow at a, a rate of growth that is what we should have expected in a recovery. We haven't seen that yet. We've been growing at around 2%, 2.5%. Uh, if we get closer to 3%, it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but that's a big jump. Yeah, it really well, I'll is. I'll take a 3% pay raise. Oh, man. How and, many people out there wouldn't want a 3% pay raise? <laughs> right, there you go. I mean, Nancy Pelosi calls it crumbs, but that's because she's like a multimillionaire. To her, it is crumbs. To her, it is crumbs. But you know what? I think this is the first year we're going to finally see some solid um, – increases in tax revenues Mm -hmm. and that's going to help the cities and towns uh, because we're lucky we have a governor that started out in municipal government he was a selectman he understands what it's like to run a town he uh, was a selectman for i believe uh, swampscape right and when you talk to the people that run these cities and towns um 
they'll tell you chapter 70 chapter 90 uh those monies have been kind of uh short lately though unrestricted local aid explain to people what chapter 70 oh, chapter sure. 90 is chapter 70 is money the state gives the cities and towns for education uh chapter 90 is money the state gives the cities and towns for uh, road repairs okay. and chapter 70 is the biggest sticking point it's based on a uh, formula and that formula is based on things like per capita income and assessed values of homes. I don't want to bore your listeners. But what eventually happens is the big cities end up with most of that Chapter 70 money. The small towns, like the ones I represent, um, are on the short end of that. And so, you know, I represent Newbury, West Newbury, Georgetown, Groven, Boxford. And the property taxes in those towns are skyrocketing. I have a house in West Newbury. The property taxes are over $10,000 a year. And that's not so unusual right now. To have a house with a five-figure property tax bill. And it, when you look at the budgets for those cities and towns, uh, most of the money goes to the school system. Right. Over 50% will go to your school system. I think we spend too much money on schools. And I'm, I get really frustrated when we start talking about education and people immediately – Start trying to defend teachers. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're attacking teachers. Yeah, teachers suck. Okay, I'm so tired. <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> no, I don't I'm say so, that. Tom. I'm so tired of people saying, "Oh no, teachers." Are, whenever the unions come out and they want to and they want to boycott and they and they want to you know whatever the unions are trying to do, uh, they want more money. They want more benefits. Uh, listen, I sat on a school committee. I remember Gary Marcoux, head of the Lawrence Teachers Union, standing in front of us arguing for us to put a teacher back in the classroom at the Arlington School that had been caught hitting a kid. Oh, gee. Okay? And yet they still get up and they defend putting these kids back, these, these teachers back in the classroom. Now, please, if you're a liberal and what you heard was that all teachers are bad because liberals are brainwashed to hear the word all when it's not there – uh, I didn't say all teachers were bad, but I think the vast majority of teachers in our public school system suck. I think they are there to indoctrinate our kids about global warming and sexual issues and social issues and being polite and not bullying instead of being there to teach. Well, can we make a distinction, though? Sure. Hey, let's make a comparison in Massachusetts between transportation and education. Excellent. Both are expensive in Massachusetts, okay? Um, and you can look at it any way you want. You can look at per-pupil spending by state. Uh, in Massachusetts, yeah, we're always in the top 10. And you can look at uh, what we spend uh, per mile of road to repair roads. When it comes to transportation, we spend about four times the national average for every mile of road. It's ridiculous. And that would be one thing if we had great roads and bridges. But guess what, Tom? They're terrible. They are They're terrible. rotten shit. They are terrible. So we spend a lot of money on transportation, and we have a poor product. Where does that money and, go? Remember we had a conversation yeah, before yes, you took office? Did. Oh, my God. It's Everywhere, everything from, and I know you don't want to hear this part, but everything from police details yeah. to prevailing wage to DEP, right. Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, everything factors in the overall cost of roads. And the thing that's a real sticking point, uh, administrative. Um, there's studies out there that show how much we spend on administration per every mile. Every state has this measure, and we're off the charts, way more expensive. We have way more people just doing management in the Department of Transportation than we do on the road making actual repairs, okay? And so at least with education, yeah, we spend a lot, but guess what, Tom? We have what is probably the best public educational system in America today. But that's only because we're comparing it to the other states which suck more. Yeah, but even if you know Massachusetts... Like, that doesn't make us good. That's no, like saying listen, Fox News is better than CNN, but they're still not good. Even if Massachusetts, if Massachusetts were a country, we would rank right up there with them on the best in the world. We really are doing a, a good job on education. I'd Our teachers that. are a big part of that. Tom. I'm sorry. I don't buy it. Well, I just don't, look I, at the I measures. Think however it is that they... Whatever, whatever they're using to measure education, mm-hmm. uh, I would like to take a look at because here's what I see. I see kids graduating from Lawrence High School that can't speak, read, and write English. I see kids graduating from North Andover High School that don't know how to balance a checkbook. I see kids graduating from Andover High School that, that just aren't even smart enough to like handle regular li- real life stuff. Yeah, that's a good point. And, it happens. And yeah, so do they know who Martin Luther King is? Yeah. Do they know uh, Do they know what social justice warrior means? Yeah, they know all that stuff. But do they have they been equipped with what it's going to take to go out into the workforce, start a business, or work at a company, and actually provide for their family? I don't think they do. You bring up a good point. Thank and you. You know what they were spending a lot of money on? Testing. And teachers have told me this. Teachers and principals have told me that we have just way too much testing from SATs to PSATs to MCAS and on and on and on. And those tests are expensive. And do we really need all of them? A lot of people, both in and out of that industry, are saying – no, we ought to cut back on the testing because it's expensive and perhaps not necessary. And maybe what we ought to be looking at 
is positive placement. Because what's the goal of education? It's to prepare people either for college or for a job. How right. good of a job are we doing at that? We don't right. even know. But when we go to our vocational schools, they actually measure that. Right. Okay, so where do you vote tech? This is my district. And they do a phenomenal job. And they actually measure positive placement. And I think it's on the order of like 97, 98% of their students are positively placed, meaning they've gone on to more education or they've gone on to a job. And we have a shortage of workers in the trades, Tom. Sure. Everything plumbing, heating, electrical, HVAC. We don't have enough workers for the jobs that are out there. And jobs are not getting done as a result. We're not getting complaints about a lack of jobs. We're getting complaints from employers who can't find workers. Well, but part, of that, find them. part of that, too, though, does go back to the education system a little bit. But yes. I, I think the overall thing is I have people come to my office at the Valley Patriot, young yep. people, all the time looking for work. None of them want to fucking work. <laughs> None of them want to work. They want a job. Yeah. But they don't want to work. So they come in and they say, well, what does my job entail? And I say, well, yeah. you have to drive around. I'm going to give you a list of 300 locations. And you're going to deliver newspapers at 300 locations. Well, that's like work. Yeah. I, ne I never hear from them again. I got a girl come in a couple of weeks ago. She wanted to sell ads for me. She's like, well, where would my desk be? And is there a water cooler? And do I get benefits? And never once did she ask me like what the job entailed. Like yeah. she, she wanted a job, but she didn't even ask me what the job was. Like what would she be doing? She knows sales, but like what? How do we do it? So I didn't hire her either. And most people that come in under the age of 30, yeah, they want a job, but they don't want to work. Uh, they they, they – they seem to care more about what they're going to get from the job than what they're going yeah. to be doing. And people like me, I don't, I, don't want, I don't want those people around. I want someone that's going to be dedicated to the mission of the Valley Patriot and help us raise money or help us get good stories. Because you don't have the time to be training every time. We can't be holding the hands. Well, right. And that's the thing. And, yeah. and, and the other thing, too, is like I always, when someone comes in looking for a job, I always throw out like the most sexist comment that I can while I'm talking <laughs> oh, to them. Geez, I know you do. Just to see how they react, okay. right? Because I, I believe in like, you know, social experimentation. <laughs> and... Um, and if they react in any negative way, I don't hire them because I don't want someone that's going to be offended by everything that I say. Right, yeah. I don't want someone that's going to be a sissy snowflake and melt every time there's a conflict. I want someone who's going to be tough. I want someone who's going to be able to take it, go out into the real world. Because you know what? I'm sending them into Lawrence. You're going to be walking around neighborhoods in Lawrence. And you're going to be mm -hmm. selling ads to Meineke mufflers or whatever. You know, I'm pretty sure that the people you're coming across and dealing with on the street on your way to and from there – uh, they're not going to be. They're not going to be concerned about your feelings. Yeah, you know what I'm exactly saying. Right. So I mean, if you're going to go out and work in the if, look, if you're going to work in a city like Boston, you're going to be in an office. And you're going to be an administrator of some kind. Then you can have all the social constructive things that you want as far as how people should talk to each other. But if you're in the real world, yeah, and you're going to be going out in the real world, suck it up. So maybe that's why I'm saying maybe we're testing the wrong thing. Yeah. Maybe instead of testing how well they can do algebra or calculus, right. maybe we should be testing how well they're ready to go to a job. Right. I mean, think about it. how did you learn to do a job before you were age 30? Uh, I worked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we're not seeing a lot of that. My now. first job, I was 14. I washed dishes at Jilly's, which was on Mass Ave. I was a dishwasher. Uh, in yeah, in North too. Andover. Mm -hmm. um, I was 14. I was working under the table. And my father knew somebody that, that owned it. Right. Um, my next job after that was selling slush on South Union Street. Right. My next job after that was, it, was working the counter at Friendly's. My next job after that was cleaning donut racks at Heavenly Donut. Nuts. So, yeah, I went out and I worked and I had I got experience by talking to people and getting fired from jobs and doing stupid things and learning what not to do. <laughs> Today's kids, they go through four years of gender studies right. in college. They come out and they can't figure out why they can't get a job. Yeah. Well, yep. how about don't take gender studies? The only the only job you can get is teaching gender studies. And then complaining about the debt you racked up right. taking gender That's studies. Right. I think I think all of our high schools should have vocational training. Mm -hmm. I think it should be mandatory. Uh, when I went to Lawrence High School, you had to take vocational training. Now I transferred into Lawrence High from the Voc, so I already had my requirements. Oh, I, you did? Okay. Uh, yeah, I started I in the Voc in carpentry, uh, and I transferred into Lawrence High in my sophomore year. So I already had all of my voc all that stuff was already done. Right. Uh, but I remember kids complaining that they had to go to woodworking shop with Mr. Hutton. Um, you know, what do I need that for? Well, yeah, if you don't get a job, you may need to actually go out and learn how to do carpentry or plumbing, and that's going to come in handy for you because not everybody can be a uh, a PhD that talks about gender studies for their for their. Job. No, I hear. Listen, I went to the Wuppen School System. We had something called industrial arts. You learn metal. You learned woodworking. We learned even, I think we had printing back then. Now, this is going back to the 1970s. Okay, I graduated a long time ago. But every kid had to do either take that or uh, home economics. One right. or the other. You had I, was to gonna, the I was other. just going to bring up home ec. Yeah. Can we make it mandatory that we teach these kids before they can graduate from high school some kind of home economics class? And not just one class. It's got to be something that's comprehensive. Yeah. Teach them how to balance a checkbook. Teach them about you know having to pay an electric bill, uh, a gas bill, a phone bill, 
Um, and actually, there all, are, all we have those... several bills pending right now to do exactly that. In fact, our good friend Diana Dezoglio, I think, has one of those bills on she's each, the best. making sure each kid that graduates knows how to balance a checkbook. Right. And my kids went through the Pawtucket school system, and that was one of the things they learned. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's invaluable. Of course, you have to know how to balance a checkbook. Right. And uh, she has a bill like that, and there's a couple more similar to that as well. Uh, of course, you know the pushback on it is, yeah, we can do that, but you know it's going to cost us a little bit of money because sure. now all of a sudden we have to add something to the – uh, other unfunded mandates that we put on our right. schools. But, you know, uh, they, they always say we have to add more money. How yeah. about just cut out all the global warming bullshit? That is, see, this is what we should work on. And there is a bill on that, too, on, on cutting back on all the regulations that we put on our schools because we have 100 years of requirements that the state puts on our local school systems. And some of them have outlived their usefulness. Mm-hmm. Maybe we have people doing things and keeping records of things that we don't need to do anymore because we, we are spending a lot per pupil. Yeah. And before we add to that, yeah, we should. We should cut back on what's not working. And by the way, teachers agree with that and, and superintendents do too don't forget a superintendent has one budget you have to pay for everything with that from snow plowing and landscaping to the lights to everyone's salary okay so if you can reduce his workload if you can reduce the requirements that we we've heaped upon him over the past several decades that helps him it helps him save money and a penny saved is a penny earned okay right. so if he can save a hundred grand a year that's just as good as giving him another hundred grand a year in fact it's probably better because you're reducing overhead too right but yeah, it's a complicated thing. Uh, we are working on it. But I will say, like I said, I'm going to repeat it. We, we have a pretty good educational system in Massachusetts. It really is. But only, again, but only, only country. compared to all of the other states, which suck more. Yeah, but look, at the economy in Massachusetts is based on that. We don't have natural resources, okay? I mean, yeah, we have a little bit of agriculture, a little bit of fisheries, a little bit of uh, industrial, but – Mostly, it's brain power. If it wasn't for that, we would have we'd be Buffalo. We really would be Tom without Harvard, MIT, Mass General, all those institutions that rely on, on us producing the brain power for that. We don't have fracking. Okay, we don't have uh, huge numbers for agriculture or timber. We just don't have that. We don't have oil. So we have to do something else. We're a small state. We're kind of limited, and so we have to make sure our high tech, our healthcare industries, uh, biotechnology. We have to make sure those are healthy. And they have been, luckily. In fact, they're too healthy. Where They've grown so much, they can't find enough help. Mm-hmm. They can't hire enough people. Now, we have to somehow close that gap. We graduate these kids every year from high schools and colleges. Why aren't they ready? Why aren't they ready to go into the I workforce? Can, I have the answer. And they're not ready because our schools, and I know this because my, my girls went to North Andover with schools. Okay. And even though North Andover's got a great school, yeah. they came home. They knew everything about global warming. <laughs> They didn't know shit about the Constitution. Yeah, that's another thing. You know what I'm saying? That's exactly. So, that's, so yeah. these teachers are teaching politics. They're not teaching subjects. You know, they they're 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 teaching social justice and anti-bullying and all of this political stuff. And that's what it is. It's politics. Let's call it politics. But what they're not teaching is like, for example, you know, when one of my girls was uh, learning about Martin Luther King, she brought home this paper that she was supposed to write about Martin Luther King. And I asked her what motivated Martin Luther King to do what he did. What was his motivation? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she said, well, racism and white people, and that's not the answer. Mm. Okay. The, the answer is Jesus Christ. Now, I'm a converted Jew, so I'm not, I'm not pushing Jesus Christ. I'm not a Catholic anymore. But the, the schools don't teach that what motivated Martin Luther King was his love of Jesus and, and, Catholic, and, and uh, not, he wasn't a Catholic. He was a Protestant. Protestantism and his faith. It mm-hmm. was his faith. That led him to do what he did and accomplish what he did. But our schools don't teach that. But number one, that's politically incorrect to say that. And number two, a teacher is probably reluctant to say that for fear of being in trouble for bringing religion into the classroom. Right. Well, that's why so we, a lot of teachers might be afraid of bringing that up. Right. I don't know. I'm just right. guessing. But, but that's what we have to change. Yeah. If we're going to teach history, first of all, let's stop calling it social studies. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, when, that's when we started losing this country. When history became social studies and they started teaching politics instead of history. If you want to teach about the Indians – you don't want to uh, – what we do now is we teach the white man is bad, the Indian's good. The white man killed the, killed the red man, white equals bad, red man equals good, and that the Indians were great. And yet we know from history, we know from reading real history that some of the Indians weren't great. Some of them raped and killed each other's tribes. They had their own slaves. The Trail of Tears, they brought their slaves with them, right? But they don't learn that. 
they learn the Trail of Tears, but they don't learn that the Indians had slaves because, well, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Yeah. We have to get rid of the politics in our education. And that's why I say the teachers suck. Not all of them. No, but let's not them. say well, – in fact, let's bring up a word that the left tries to bring up all the time. Okay. How about that word diversity? Uh, because when it comes to colleges and universities, they talk about diversity. You really want to see me lose it? But the only kind of diversity they talk about is what? Diversity of skin, diversity. ethnicity, gender. Right. Things like that. Things that don't matter. But not diversity they never, of thought. Exactly. So how diverse is their history department? So how, yeah. how many – Republicans or conservatives out there on their staff. Yes, yeah, zero, zero. Zero. So what happens when a kid graduates from those universities? I mean, I went to Boston College. I saw it firsthand. Firsthand, the entire history department was made up of leftists. Yeah. And you could see it has an effect on the students graduating. And, and that's why so many of our university students come out with that mindset. Right. And it's a very closed-minded, intolerant mindset. Okay? We even have Merrimack College, uh, which I was going to mention in the first segment. Merrimack College, which is a which is not a public institution. It's a private uh, I think the uh, the uh, Augustinians run it. Uh, they're offering now a major in social justice. Yeah. Now, how can you claim to be any kind of a religious organization, any kind of a, having any kind of religious faith at all, and want to teach hatred? Because that's what social justice is. It's hatred. It's hatred of white people. It's hatred of cops. It's hatred of the military, and it's really unhinged. If you talk to any of these social justice warriors. They're, they're just mentally ill. There's well, something it comes wrong back with to that them. diversity thing. You know what? It, it, it's fine to put forth that that perspective. When I was uh, in college, uh, the history on Christopher Columbus was he was this evil European that came here and raped the land and stole the gold, and right. et cetera, et cetera. And that's fine. We need to make sure the truth is known if that's, in fact, the truth. But we never hear the other side of it. Right. But what was the effect, the long-term effect of having Europe, you know – Come over here and, and settle this area. Right. Uh, we never hear the other side of the story. We just don't. So there is a lack of diversity. Right. It really is. I think it's no. funny that liberals and Democrats really care that immigrants came here from Europe and stole the evil. I mean, and, stole, and were evil and stole the poor yeah. Indians' land, and they were more and they're more concerned about the people who were here than the people coming here. 200 years ago. Yeah. But today, yeah. it's they care more about the people coming here than the people who are already well, here. Well, there's that too. Yeah. There's that That's too. What, and I say on every show, and I'll say it again, every single thing the Democrats believe is in direct contradiction to everything else the Democrats believe. Everything they believe, <laughs> everything they believe is in – for example, you on the legislature, I don't know how you voted on this. I hope you voted the right way. On which one? On uh, the, hands, the hands-free driving. Uh, to not use your phone while you're driving. Oh yeah. Uh, so the cops can now pull you over as a primary reason if they see you using you texting and driving. Well, you're a big cop guy, don't you? Want cops to be able to do this? I do. Okay. But here, this was my problem. You have people like Barbara Italian. Mm -hmm. You have people like um, what's your name in in Lowell? Uh, help me out here. Colleen Gary. Uh, no, the 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 senator from Lowell, the one John McDonald's running against. I don't know. The blonde. What's her okay, name? I don't she's, know. She's going to run for Congress. Uh, you have you have these liberal left wing Democrats like Jamie Eldridge, who get up and they rail against police officers. Right? They say police officers are evil, jackbooted thugs. They pull over black men because they're racist, and they attack black men because they're racist, and they have too much discretion. And then they turn around and they pass a bill that gives cops another opportunity with discretion to pull over black people and pretend. That those black oh, people so you were against me. this bill? I was against the bill. Oh, yeah. really? Because we got a lot of calls and a lot of emails from constituents that wanted something done about this. Is every other state is passing yeah. a law that prohibits a handheld device yeah. being put up to your ear. And don't forget, it's already prohibited for uh, commercial trucks. That's federal. The yeah. feds control that. So if you drive a commercial vehicle, you're not allowed to put a phone to your ear. First, we got a lot of phone calls first, on this. First of all, I, I, think, I think the law is needless because now I can just say, hey, Siri, text Lenny Mera, tell him mm -hmm. I'm on my way. Well, that's what we want. Look, we want that. My phone, my phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we want or a Bluetooth device right. where it's, where it's hands-free. But my problem was the hypocrisy of it's the Democrats that push this in the legislature, the same Democrats that say that the cops have too much discretion and they're all a bunch of racists. I'd love to go off on them. But Black I'm not, lives I'm matter. I'm going to defend them here. I'm going to defend them. No, Tom. Tom and then they, they pass a bill that allows cops, these same people that yeah. they believe are evil cops that are going to pull over black men for being black. They just gave them another tool to pull over black people for no reason. It just goes to show that they don't even really believe what they say they believe. That's my problem. No, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Right. I, I think they responded to the He's got to work with them every day. That's I got to work with them. <laughs> and by the way, the ones in Beacon Hill um, are not like the ones in the media. You know, yeah. it, there's a less partisan, there's less partisan discord in the state house than what you'll see in the media and less than what you'll see down in Washington too. Not to pat ourselves in the back, not to brag, but the two parties uh, on Beacon Hill tend to work together a lot better than the two parties down in Washington. So we have a Republican governor 
in a very deeply blue state. And he finds a way to balance the budget every single year without a tax increase. And don't forget, state government can't print money. We can't just borrow endlessly like the feds do. We have to truly balance our budget every single year. Mm-hmm. And we've been doing it without a broad-based tax increase. And we have a speaker, by the way, who's agreeing with the governor on that, are not imposing another broad-based tax increase. He made that promise again just this week in his state of the state address. So that's something that, you know, like I said, I don't want to brag about it, but it's something we ought to be happy about because there's going to be a couple of ballot questions uh, this November. As you know, there'll be one uh, to increase the income taxes on people making over a million dollars a year. We have to change the Constitution to do that. And by the way, Massachusetts, as you know, has a Constitution that was written by John Adams himself. It's the oldest Constitution in the world still in use today. The oldest one in the world. And we're going to change it because the re- one of the requirements of the Constitution is everyone pays the same right, tax as it, as rate. It, as yeah. it should it's be. It's a flat tax. Right. And it works. So why are we going to discriminate against people exactly. who make more money just because they make more money? Yeah. And the, the Democrat answer is, well, they have more. You don't know that. Mm-hmm. Just because they make more does not mean they have more. Well, they'll use extreme measures like professional athletes like Tom Brady makes donuts. Is that of what that is? Of course we did. Yeah, that's for you, Tom. And, uh, you know, if Tom Brady makes $25 million a year, well, he should pay a higher rate. Well, we've had a flat tax for a long time in Massachusetts, and uh, it's worked. Right. You know, look at where the states that have already done Dude, that's for you. Look at the states that already have yeah, the best. that graduated income tax. So I'm looking at New York, California. What is it? Connecticut, maybe Rhode Island. What are their budgets like? What is their fiscal situation like? Mm-hmm. I'd say it's worse than ours. And they already have a graduated income tax. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, but anyways, just bringing that up because it's something that uh, your listeners will want to pay attention to because in November, that will probably be on the ballot. Right. Um, the MBTA, I want to just talk about this. Then we're going to take a quick break and sure. come back and talk about your book. Um, the MBTA, I've been following this. Uh, Bruce Tarr has been on the forefront of this. He's a state senator from Gloucester. Gloucester. Thank you. I always want to say Essex. Um, and he's he's been keeping me up on these things at least three or four times a week. I get press releases from him. They're trying to reform the M, uh, the MVRTA. Is not the MVRTA. The M, uh, MBTA. MBTA. Yes. Thank you. Right. Um, millions and millions and millions of missing money. Millions. And again, I think we had a conversation about this right before you took office. Yeah. Um, where is it? Like they could say, okay, we found that there's missing money and we're going to tighten the system and it's never going to happen again. But like with Suzanne Bump's audits, I don't see anybody going to jail. I don't see, I don't mm-hmm. see law enforcement stepping in and saying. So I guess like if you rob a bank and you get a thousand dollars, you go to jail for twenty years. Right. But if you steal twenty million dollars mm-hmm. from the MBTA, not so much. Right. From what I'm seeing, I mean, I'm only going by what I see. You're there every day. It's well, bookkeeping. It's a lot of things, and we. Trying to fix the MBTA is like unraveling a bowl of spaghetti. And we gained a big victory when we uh, allowed the Baker administration to suspend the Pacheco rule at the MBTA, only for a limited amount of time. I hate that rule. So we were able to privatize things like the money counting room. Think about it. We had these state workers counting money. And that's probably where a lot of it did go missing. Right. It was just poor behavior on their part. And the, the privatization of just that one thing is already saving us millions of dollars. Same with the parts warehouse. We have warehouses holds parts for buses and trains. It, it would take like a week just to get the right parts to the mechanics from the warehouse to the mechanics. And now we're privatizing that because there's companies that specialize in that. Private sector companies that just do nothing else but that. And they're really good at it. They do a better job. And at a lower price, so we were able to privatize those things. But you know what, you know, you know what, liberals and Democrats hear when they hear the word privatization, right? Yeah, it gets evil, e- every step. evil yeah. corporations are going to make right. money. Well, right. yeah, as opposed to political hacks who get jobs and don't do any work making money. At least if it's privatized, the work's yeah. getting done. Exactly. And and by the way, when you start to privatize certain pockets like that, it makes the rest of the organization stand up and notice, by the way, we can privatize next. Right. Maybe we ought to get our act together. And that happened with the uh, the uh, mechanics, MBTA mechanics. They were going to be privatized next. So guess what? They came to the negotiating table with a plan of their own to save money. Excellent. And without that leverage of, of privatization hanging over their heads, they probably wouldn't have done that time. Right. So it's a victory. The problem is, you know, we need 100 small victories like that. Uh, it's, it, there's not going to be one bill or uh, thing we can do to save all that money. It's going to be a lot of little steps just like that. And you've got a Democrat legislature, majority Democrat, yeah. vast majority Democrat. Um uh, I don't, how, how does how does any reform actually happen? I mean, uh, they're the ones making the money on all this stuff. Yeah, because we have a governor that's willing to sit down with them. So 
Governor Baker will sit down with Speaker DeLeo and whoever the Senate president is at the time. It was Stanley Rosenberg. He's not there anymore. But he would simply sit down with him and explain, here's how we have to save money. Because the MBTA, I mean, it's not a secret. Um, we spend more per passenger mile than just about any mass transit agency in the world. And we're a small state. And we're tiny. We're tiny. And so – it's undeniable. So he was able to get them to suspend Pacheco. How did he get that done? I mean, Democrats have veto approved uh, majorities in both the House and the Senate, right? But he was able to get it done because we simply explained, you know, our constituents demand better service and lower prices. And that's what we work for. We work for our constituents. We work for the voters. And and we got it done just by sitting down and being reasonable with them. Uh, it's something Washington could probably learn a little bit from. Um, you know, right now we have a, a president who's at the same party as, as uh, the House and the Senate. And uh, even he's having a hard time getting things done. He hasn't got even right. half the things he wants done, right? I love when CNN comes on and they say, even Republicans are against what Donald Trump did to – as if, like, they're all part of the same team. Yeah. We know – those way. of us who actually follow that campaign, we know that most of the Republicans did not want Donald Trump. They did not. I no. think the party actively worked against they him. Did. They did. And they're still working actively against him. I mean, Lindsey yeah. Graham is doing everything humanly possible to get a Democrat elected in the years. He <laughs> I is. wouldn't say that, but – I said that. But they worked against well, – And listen, I like Lindsey. He follows me. During the, pr- during the primaries, we had, like, what, a dozen Republicans? Republicans running for president, mm-hmm. right? And most of them came to Massachusetts. We got to meet them up close and personal. I, mean, I got to sit down next to Kasich and Rubio and um, Rand Paul. And by the way, Rand Paul was the smartest of the bunch by a mile. He's an extremely smart he guy. Is. And he got no traction. He bowed out. And, um, you know, I ended up back in uh, Governor Kasich. That's a nice picture. Yeah. And uh, But the party worked against Trump. Not a single person endorsed Donald Trump right. during the primaries. Our more conservative guys, uh, like Jim Lyons, our friend Jim Lyons, backed um, – Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz. Right. And um, I, I and a bunch of people back Governor Kasich and a lot of people back Marco Rubio. I was with Scott Walker okay. for 15 minutes. He came here. He was and, a great and, guy. And then he dropped out and yeah. I was with Chris Christie. Okay. And five days after I endorsed Chris Christie, I met um, we met with him up in Nashua. He dropped out of the race. Yeah. And I looked around and I said, really, I wanted Chris Christie because he was a no-nonsense Call it the way that it is. You like the way he talks, don't you? I do. <laughs> and I so it. the next natural progression was Donald Trump. So I called my yeah. friend who worked for Donald Trump and said, can I meet him? He said, yeah, sure. Come on up and I'll really? take care of you. And that's how we got the picture of him holding the Valley Patriot. You have to meet him in person. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you, no, we got him holding the Valley Patriot. Wow. That's a good score for you. So I got to interview him. I got to interview him four times. Uh, I got to meet him six times. I uh, actually got a chance to go on his plane. That was pretty interesting. You got on his plane. Yeah, we got on his plane. It looks – it looks – it looks better than the highest priced hotel you've ever been in no your life. I mean, I walked in and I thought I was I thought I was in Trump Towers. Wow. Yeah. Yep. So well, that's cool. Anyways. Nice. Got to meet him. All right. I guess that's it. Shows all. We ran out of things to talk about. Sorry, kids. <laughs> all right. Well, listen. We're gonna take a quick break, uh, and then we want to talk about your new book. I want to ask you a couple of questions about opioids, big opioid situation right. in Massachusetts. How we're gonna fix that? Uh, some public safety things. Uh, we can go to two hours today, but we don't have Ira. We don't have Kiana. Uh, so we may not go the full two hours. We may go till uh, 3.30. We'll just kind of play it by ear, see how it goes. We're going to take a three-minute break. And then we'll be back on Paying Attention.
attention is back. Once again, here's your host, Tom Dutch. You're going to have to have another training session. All right, welcome back uh, to the Paying Attention uh, podcast. I'm Tom Duggan. Uh, we're going to do this fine, fine little show here for uh, the rest of the afternoon for at least another half hour or so. Um, Sitting to my left is State Representative Lenny Mira. He is a State Representative out of Newberry. I keep saying West Newberry, Newberry. West Newberry. It's my hometown. You know? It's kind of the same, though, right? Isn't it? To some people, it is. Yeah. It's just different municipalities. It's one of the wealthiest communities in the state, I think. Is, is that correct, maybe? We do okay. Yeah. We do okay. Um, he's a conservative. He is a Republican. Uh, if you're a liberal, you just heard me say racist. Uh, even though I didn't, even though I didn't use that word because because liberals are brainwashed to hear words that you don't say, um, and I met Lenny when he was running, and I've been kind of following his the progression of him in the state house. Uh, when before you took office, we had a conversation. We had several. And I told you like a whole bunch of stuff. I laid like a whole bunch of stuff on you. And you kept looking at me with your mouth open going, but that can't be true, Tom. I mean, can you prove that? And I said, look, come see me in two years, what you've been in for two years when you're running for re-election. And you tell me if I'm right. I'm going to plead guilty to at least one of those things. So you told me that every time you request information from a town clerk or whatever, public information, you get, you get denied. That yeah. you couldn't get public information. I said, that can't be true, Tom. It's open to the public. You can get all of the stuff, and you know what? You ended up being right. Yeah. Because a lot of the um, places from the state police to our town clerks simply withhold information or they'll charge an exorbitant amount of money right. to, to relinquish it. And so you came to the state house one day um, bragging, rightfully so, about how we were able to get a bill passed uh, requiring that this information be made available or at a nominal cost. Right. And you were right. I was absolutely wrong about that. I'm not afraid to admit it, but because I naively thought that you could easily get things um, – like the information you use in your in your news stories, but it wasn't about you being wrong. It was about you. You weren't inside yet, right? Correct. And so the average person yet. walking around thinks if there's a law, that's the way things are. Yes. They don't realize that a law is just words on a paper if nobody's implementing it. It can be. And so I remember sitting down with Lenny and saying, "Look, I went to Antigua and I went to the state and I went to DEP and I asked for documents. I can't get any documents." And he's like, "But yeah, but there's a law. How how is that possible?" So we had to actually write a new law. Yes. And thank you for supporting my law. Oh, absolutely. Um, we had it submitted by Katie Ives in the Senate. We had it submitted by uh, Jim Lyons and Diana DiZoglio in the House. I think you were one of the co-sponsors, as yeah. was um, uh, Linda Campbell from, from Methuen. And we got 90% of what we asked for. They wanted yes. some of it down. Right. But we got 90% of what we asked for. And so we're going to be we're going to be coming back. We're going to be coming back to close some of those loopholes in the next six months. Hopefully, we can count on your support for that. Absolutely. Um, but I, I, I kept looking at you like this wide-eyed guy, this, <laughs> this naive guy that hasn't really yeah. been involved in state politics for a while. We talked about the missing paintings, and we talked about a yep. bunch of stuff. And he just kept looking at me going, you know, look, I like you, but none of that can be true. How can that possibly be true? And yet yep. here we are. And not only did Lenny's eyes get opened yeah. to all of these things, he wrote a book. He oh, wrote, he, he did. He wrote a book about it. Yeah, I, I tagged him this with our good friend Timothy M. Holt, Yeah, who you, I guess you've written some books with, right? I did. I wrote uh, Fighting Spirit with Tim M. Holt. Did you? And he's a very intelligent guy. He's written a number of books. And we put our heads together. We're good friends. Um, we met when he ran for Congress one time. And we wanted to do a, a TV show. We wanted to do a screenplay, something along the lines of uh, House of Cards. And so we were kicking around different ideas. And he said, you know, it's hard to just write a screenplay and get something on TV. He said, how about we write some books, like some small short stories that could perhaps turn into a series. And it started off serious, like a drama, like House of Cards. And it ended up getting more into a comedy or a dramedy, if you will, um, just to show the lighter side of uh, what goes on in state government and perhaps national uh, government. So it's loosely based on uh, the Bulger Brothers Um Billy Bulger, of course, was a Senate president at one time. His uh, brother, Whitey, was a known gangster. So we have the – Some would argue speaker, that the other guy was a gangster too. Yeah, some would argue that. Know it. So we have something modeled around that where the Speaker of the House is modeled on Billy Bulger and his brother is a, uh, a known gangster uh, who gets things done on the slide. But there's some backstories, there's different storylines. Uh, it's all based on fictional characters, but there's one character based on a real live person. That's the 
person by the name of Tom Duggan, who in this book uh, plays a hard driving, hard digging, hard drinking newspaper editor who has an insatiable thirst for exposing people and, and, and wrongdoings in government. And uh, so I'm a character in your book. You are a character in the book. That is phenomenal. I, I can't I can't think of a higher compliment than someone making me a character in their book or their play. Yeah, or, or, he's got or a bottle movie. of scotch and a loaded revolver in his desk. I mean, that's how that's how people people picture Tom Duggan. Right. And so you know, hopefully it'll be get turned into a news uh, a television show, and maybe Tom Duggan can play himself. Yeah, in be, that series, that'd be fun. It would be a lot of fun. It would be a blast. And yeah. you know, the, the overall goal, the end game. I, is to hopefully someday uh, bring a lighthearted approach to government. And so hopefully it'll become less polarized, uh, less partisan, and, and maybe, um, you know, we can kind of really deal with the political rancor that, that that's so familiar now down in Washington. If you bring a lighthearted approach to it, and so I'm looking forward. To, will you sign? Will you sign a book for me? Yeah, of course, I'll sign because a book. I've got my book that I'm going to give you. I know you don't have it yet. It's uh, Heroes in Our Midst. You can get this on Amazon. You can get it on uh, Barnes and Nobles, but we actually make more money if you buy it from me at the office of the Valley Patriot. Now I'll, I'll sign it for you if you want one. And what we did was we we took all the stories we've written about veterans over the last thirteen right. years, and we compiled all of our stories from the Valley Patriot into one book. So I'm going to sign this and give this to you, and hopefully you can sign that for me. Will so, do. So this is going to be a a uh, a humorous look at inside politics, and st- I understand from from talking to some people that. There's some stories in here that you represent as not really true that actually really happened. Is that true? No, 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 no. Depending how you want to spin it. All right. We okay. just went off in a bunch of different directions. I said a bad thing. Sorry. No, you did not. No, that's okay. Nothing to create more interest in it, hopefully. Gotcha. So, so you, how did you and Tim Imholt, my uh, my former uh, co-author of Fighting Spirit, how did you guys end up hooking up to do this? Uh, we hung out, you know, um, just socially a few times and over several drinks and several ha- meals. Did you play Have? You met Lenny? <laughs> <laughs> you play that? Yeah, no, no, no nothing like that. But Every time I go over, he's, he's trying to hook me up. He, Tim? Yeah, like we went to we went to Wild Buffalo Wings in Danvers one day. Yeah, and the waitress came over and he played. Have you met Tom? Oh, and then he made yeah. her sit down, and then he introduced. He told her all these great yeah, things about me. Him. Half of it wasn't true, but I just played along with it <laughs> to try and get her phone number. He's he's a good wingman. He is, and he's got a lot of stories. Uh, he was what a Green Beret, I believe. Yep. He's got a lot of Seal Team stories. One. Was he on SEAL Team I believe 1? he was. I didn't even know. Yeah. But uh, he's quite a guy. He's a very intelligent guy, too. Very sharp, very shrewd. Uh, he has a number of patents. Uh, he has a number of businesses that he created and sold over the years as well. And um, so he brings with him a lot of knowledge. And he's a good writer, too, which I'm not. So this is not Da Vinci Code. I don't want to build up your hopes here. Right. But it's just a bunch of short stories, different plot lines that go off in a bunch of different directions. And we want to see what's popular, what people find more intriguing. So hopefully the next series of books uh, will kind of go in that direction more. So just something we did out of fun. Now, would you be interested? There's two things I think you might be interested in. One would be uh, maybe signing some books and donating them for our bash on March 23rd. Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure once we tell people that I'm one of the main characters, they're going to want the book, right? At least my, my March crowd. March 23rd. Is that March good? 23rd is the bash. Okay. All right. That's right? coming up. And you're going to be speaking this year, right? If you ask me to, I'll uh, speak. Will you speak? Yeah, in fact, I did last time. Didn't yes, I? absolutely. Okay. Look forward I think to you it. spoke again. We gave Bruce Tarr a First Amendment award, I think, and you were one you of the did. presenters. And our right? good friend Duncan Burns got an award, too, for he journalism did. or something. He did. I wanted to give him an award this year, but we can't give him an award two years in a row. But every, <laughs> everything he writes is just so great. It's hard not to give him an award. He is something. He finds information. Uh, he's just a junkie. He's like us. He likes to research these things, yeah. and he's very good at it. He is. And he pulls out information that no one else will talk about. So, uh, no, looking forward to it. March 23rd, yeah, we'll definitely hand out some. Yeah, and we're going to actually do the the show before the bash. Okay. We're going to get the bash committee to come in, and we're going to get some videos from previous bashes to show people what we do every year. Because I don't think people get, you know, they think, oh, he runs this event once a year. But I don't think they get what we do because we raise – we raised thirty six thousand dollars last year. Holy one smokes! Night. Was it that much? It was that wow. the year before it was eighteen. The year before that it was eight. And where does it go? So, um, and it goes to a whole bunch of places. So we give money to uh, one tail at a time dog rescue in Haverhill. Uh, we gave out I think six one thousand dollars scholarships to kids graduating from Lawrence High School, um, Methuen, the Voke. And then I think we gave like a two hundred dollars scholarship to a kid from North Andover, um, and we gave like a thousand dollars to Veterans Northeast Outreach in Haverhill. Wow, um, you do we, a lot with the we, veterans. We do a lot with the veterans, and what, so what I try to do is like I'm an investigative reporter, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm always investigating these nonprofits because most of them, most nonprofits are frauds, and I know that everyone's just going to be upset that I said that, but I mean it. 
most nonprofits are frauds. Have you, you told the auditor about this? You uh, well, or the Suzanne, General? Su- listen, Suzanne Bump and I speak extensively about this very topic every time we get really? together. Yes. Okay. Most nonprofits are fraud. You donate money to a nonprofit, for example. And I'm not going to mention which names because I don't want to get in trouble with with those people. But there's a local law enforcement agency that raises money for scholarships. They hire because police officers can't call you on the phone and ask you for money. It's considered maybe extortion. They can't? No. By law, they're not allowed to solicit money if you're a police officer. So they have to hire someone to call people to solicit money for their scholarship fund. Well, like six cents out of every – out of every ten – six cents out of every – six cents out of every ten cents – goes to the people collecting. And four cents out of every 10 cents goes to the actual nope. nonprofit. Now, if the nonprofit has a leader of the nonprofit, a president of the nonprofit, a, a CEO of the nonprofit, that person's drawing a salary. So four cents becomes two cents, becomes one cent. And the dollar that you gave, like maybe you're lucky if one or two pennies goes to where it's supposed to go. Right. So what I've done as a, as a uh, investigative reporter is throughout the years, we've kind of kept a list of nonprofits where everything you give or almost everything you give goes directly where it's supposed to go. So when you write a check to One Tail at a Time Dog Rescue in Haverhill, yep. they don't take a salary. Every single person there is a volunteer. They have no administrative overhead. They don't pay rent. They have the, the, the shack that they use in Groveland is donated to them by somebody. So we went and we sat down with Kate Whitney one day and we went through their books and said, yeah, like literally 99% of the money that people donate actually goes to rescuing puppies and finding them foster families. So let's put them on our list. And when we started raising money at our bash, we put them on our list to donate to because we know where the money's going to go. Veterans Northeast Outreach, 100, not 99, 100% of the money that they get at Veterans Northeast Outreach in Haverhill goes to homeless veterans, 100%. That's good to know. So they, have, yeah. they, get, they get grants from the federal government to pay for their administrative costs. So when people donate a dollar, that dollar goes where it's supposed to go. So we put them on our list. And so with this bash that we do every year, and I, I'm so great to, grateful that you come because I think you, you add a lot to it. Um, you know, we try and get as many of our – I try to extort from all my political friends <laughs> and all of our advertisers. We get them all in I was going to say, how do we donate? I remember cutting a check last year, but it was to buy an ad. Is that what we did yeah, last well, year? Yeah, so you can sponsor the event. There's yep. different sponsorship levels. If you, if you sponsor like $1,000, you get like a free table. You get like a $25 in raffle tickets, stuff like that. Uh, and that money will go directly to a scholarship, or you can buy an ad book in the an ad in the program book. Okay. Or if you wanted to, and you want to donate money just specifically for a scholarship, and you want it to be a tax write off because we're not a nonprofit, uh, you can write it. You can write your check to the Lawrence High Alumni Association. Oh, good to we know. We will hand it directly to them, and they'll give the money to the kid. And in fact, they don't even give the money to the kid. They actually give the money to the college that the kid's attending to. So there's nowhere along that process where any money can be siphoned off. Right, the money goes directly to the Lawrence High Alumni Association. Chris Eldridge and his team pick a kid. Uh, they write a check directly to UMass Lowell or directly to BC or wherever, wherever right. the kid's going. And so we don't have to worry. So we basically built this event to be for the nonprofits that are actually nonprofit. Oh, that's good to and, know. And, so, and we, tra- we also give awards to veterans and we give awards to police officers and we give awards to firefighters. Uh, and we do a couple of little special things throughout the night. But all year we're working on this. Um, We sponsored the menorah lighting in North Andover. We use bash money for that. Uh, There's a young kid named Liam Norcross who's going for his Eagle Scout project. He needs an extra $100 uh, for his project. He's doing something on the rail trail in Methuen. Okay. We're just going to write him a check for $100. We use bash money for that. So this is local too. So it's all local. I try not to give to any national organizations because you can't track the money. Exactly. And we personally go and we vet them. And I'm glad that you you help us out every year. Well, you know what it is? This year especially because um, I made a a promise to donate my legislative pay raise. A bunch of us voted against that giant pay raise that we got last year. And so people asked us, well, since you voted against it and you are against it, what are you doing with your pay raise? Why don't you give it back to the government? The problem is if you refuse to take your pay raise, it does not go into the general fund. That money would go to a fund controlled by the Speaker of the House. It goes to a house fund. Um, now, I'm good friends with Robert DeLeo. I'm not, I love the guy. But, you know, I'm not giving him my money. Right. He's got enough as it is. Right. Um, so I said I'm going to donate my pay raise to local charities. So right. this is a good one. It's going to go to people in this area. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, maybe we can get you, maybe we can get your pay raise this year. 
And maybe, <laughs> that's every, maybe, maybe every, next year. I, you know, like I said, we're not. I'm just a rank and file. Yeah, watch a backpedal now. <laughs> well, back pedal. But I don't get the thirty thousand dollar raise that you read about in the newspapers. That right. goes to leadership positions, chairman. Republicans don't get those things. Right. Um, but we did get like a seven thousand dollar. That's a huge raise. And after taxes, it's probably you know five thousand or at least a hundred a week. I'd so, be happy with a thousand. Oh, absolutely. But what I'm saying is I want to donate 100 a week or, right. or about that much to charities uh, in this area and to causes in this area. My key is to make it local. Right. Okay. Not Red Cross or United Way or anything yeah, far away. Never, ever, ever give you to the Red Cross. You say that all the time. Never. I've been yeah. saying it since 2006. You've always said that. Yeah. Never give to the Red Cross. Never give to United Way. Never. Never, never, never. Like zero percent of the money you donate goes where it's supposed to go. But zero. if I want to go to a veteran in this area, this is a good place to do it. Right. Yeah. Veterans Northeast Outreach on Leeds Street right. and Haverhill is the best place to donate to. Um, and anybody who's ever looking, by the way, for a, uh, a, a nonprofit, you want to do something for a local charity. Give us a buzz. Shoot me an email. I've got a list in my office of actual nonprofits that are actually nonprofit. Um, just because someone calls themselves a 501c3 doesn't really mean they're not nonprofit. I don't think most people understand that calling yourself a nonprofit just means that at the end of the year, if you've got $5 million in the bank, you have to spend it. And how you spend it is up to you. Uh -huh. So we watch places like Lawrence Community Works, for example. And I don't want to get off on a whole thing about them, but I just want to use like a great local example. You know, if they've got a million dollars left over in their coffers at the end of the year, their board gets together and they all just vote to give themselves like a bonus at the end of the year and everybody just cashes a check. That's not nonprofit. Right. People here, everything in America today is called the opposite of what it really is, right? Because <laughs> the nonprofits, certainly most of them are not nonprofit. Anyways, I think we've beaten a dead horse on that topic. Um, opioids, let's just, uh, how much time we got? Where are we? Oh, that's not bad. Um, can you give us like another 10, 15 minutes? I can. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. So we've got this huge opioid problem. Yes. And it seems as though the legislature wants to pretend they care about it, but not actually do anything about it. So Diana DiZoglio got up at the house. I don't know if you were there when she gave her speech. I was clapping and I was watching it live on my in my office. I was clapping even though no one could see me. Um, she got up and she excoriated leadership. She excoriated her own party, which is why I love Diana, because they promised that they were going to give some of this additional revenue that came in, that they were going to spend X number of millions of dollars for beds for people with opioid addiction to get them treatment, this marijuana money, right, if I'm remembering right. Yes, because uh, there was supposed to be a, there's a tax on marijuana. There was a difference between the House and Senate on how much of a tax to put on marijuana. And don't forget, we had a ballot question passed legalizing um, recreational marijuana. And so the House had a lower tax, the Senate had a higher tax. We settled somewhere in between. And one of the things I could cut out was um, that program that you just mentioned that Diana Tzadzaki put forward. And I believe the other thing, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, uh, she wanted some of the money to go towards education so that the schools would get this money so that they could teach or train students um, on how to avoid addiction in the first place. Because I believe that's what she was fighting for more than anything mm -hmm. else. And um, but they lied. She, they promised they were going to put this money aside. She thought she was going to get it, yes. And, and then they um, didn't. Just like, just like when they raised taxes on cigarettes, right? All we heard were the lies. And this is, again, I just I hate the lies. If you're going to do something, just tell us what you're going to do. They said, oh, this money is going to go to people who have emphysema problems. Yeah. It's going to be a special dedicated fund for people that have lung problems from smoking. And then when no one was looking, nine months later, they took all of that flipping money and they put it into the general fund and they blew it. They, went to they blew fund. every flipping yeah. dime of it. So now when they say we're going to raise the gas tax so we can fix roads, who can believe them? Yeah. They're a bunch of flipping liars. And this is – the real problem is that the media doesn't call them out. Where is the Boston Globe? Where is Channel 7? Where's the Lowell Sun? Where's the Eagle Champion? Why aren't they calling out our elected officials when they promote a tax or they promote a yeah. bill based on what they promise will be in effect? Then A, they don't measure the effect afterwards, and B, they take the money and use it for something else, and everyone just says, oh, well, that's just government. Yeah. And then we wonder why there's like millions of dollars missing out of the MBTA because – People who are stealing money from our government mm -hmm. know that no one cares. Yeah, they get away with it far too often. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And by the way, that was a sticking point when I first got elected. I wanted to make sure that um, taxes that are supposed to go to road repairs go to road repairs. Right. And, and now they do. So we have a tax on gasoline, a tax on diesel fuel. We have tons of fees for just to register a vehicle. And a commercial vehicle has even more. Mm -hmm. I have a giant poster I had made up, a picture of a dump truck um, that lists all the different taxes. Because when I first got elected, I would tell people we have a – 
over a dozen different taxes that are supposed to go to road repairs. And people didn't believe me. Even elected officials did not believe me. So I had this giant three by four picture made up of one of our dump trucks with all the taxes listed. And it was a $150,000 dump truck and over $33,000 in taxes and fees just wow. to put on the road, just for one year. Wow. And don't forget, a lot of those you'll pay every year. Because in addition to the state taxes on gas and diesel, there are federal taxes on gas and diesel. You pay a state excise tax on your vehicle to your city or town. Guess what? For commercial vehicles, there's a, a federal excise tax of about 12%. You'll pay it when you buy the truck, and you'll pay it for every time you buy something for that truck, whether it's a tire or a tail light. You will pay a 12% FET, federal excise tax, and that's supposed to go to our roads and bridges. And for a it, long it time, does it? A long time, for a long time, it got diverted. I don't know if it is now. I'd have to check, uh, but that Fed money is supposed yeah, to come check to the on states. That for us, we, we, we like follow up because nobody. Absolutely. See, we're not geniuses at the Valley Patriot. I get a lot of emails all the time from people <laughs> you going, You guys do a good job. No, I think but you guys I, do a fabulous I get, job. I get all emails all the time like, Oh, you guys are geniuses. I love that investigation that you did on whatever. And, and I always call them up and say, Listen, I just want to be clear about something. We're not geniuses. But the rest of the media is so mm -hmm. flipping bad at what they do yeah, that all we have to do is true. show up and do our job, and we look like geniuses. For a, you know what a, I'm saying? For a lot of those, a lot of those um, issues, yeah, it absolutely is true, and uh, it doesn't take much. I mean, with a few phone calls, a person, a reporter could find out where that money is going. Right at the state level, yeah, it is going to the roads. Is the federal money going there? To this day, we don't really right. know for sure. Is right. it, it could be going to just a general fund, and it's going to become an issue this year. I think there's going to be an infrastructure bill um, in Congress. And I think Trump wants it. I think now the Republicans want it as well. And the question is going to become, well, how do we pay for it? And like I said, we already have a dozen different taxes that are supposed to go to roads and bridges. Where's all that money going to? Right. Where, where has it been going to? Right. And the, the feds, I'll give them credit for one thing. They do one thing smart. They have a, um, a, a tax on diesel fuel that's a little bit higher than the tax on, on gasoline. And that's for a good reason. It's because almost all the wear and tear on roads and bridges is caused by these big, heavy trucks. Your car, my car causes very little of any kind of wear and tear on a road. It's those big, heavy trucks. And the best way to raise taxes is to tax that diesel fuel, because the bigger and heavier, heavier the truck is, the more diesel fuel it'll burn. The more miles they go on, the more fuel they'll burn. But if you talk to these cab, these uh, these truck drivers, yeah, they'll tell you, you know, from their perspective, they're getting hit with so they many are. taxes. They are. And I don't understand the, the, the mentality of where are we going to get the money well, you are already in charge of billions and billions of dollars. A lot of what is being wasted. Yeah. A lot of it is on stuff that is immeasurable. For example, um, and I'll just give you like a, a small example. Like uh, Nikki Songas comes to Valley Works Career Center a couple of years ago, yeah. and she presents this big check for I don't know what the exact number is. Let's say it's thirty thousand dollars for uh, Groundwork Lawrence to have a green technology jobs training class. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I went over to Nikki Stong and said, I like Nikki. We get along well, even though she's a Democrat. And I said, um, so when this is over, uh, how do you measure how effective spending this money was? Because I don't know too many Latinos in Lawrence who have the opportunity to work in a green technology business. I don't know any green technology businesses in Lawrence. I don't know where there are any wind farms in Lawrence. I don't yeah. know whether there are any solar plants in Lawrence. So, so other than the photo op, what is the purpose of this? Well, I think she's trying to create jobs in Lawrence because the unemployment rate is pretty low in Massachusetts. And if you look at it on a town-by-town -town basis, it's ultra low. I mean, my towns are doing great. Three and a half, four percent unemployment in Groveland, Boxford, Georgetown. Then all of a sudden you get to Lynn or Lawrence or Lowell and it's almost twice as high. And it's been like that for a long time when you get into these big cities. So I think, you know, to Nikki Saugus' defense, I think she's trying to address that. She's a Lowell um, representative, isn't she? That's her town, isn't it? And she's trying to help her town. I mean, I don't blame her for that because those cities are, for some reason, suffering from higher unemployment than all the surrounding cities. Not by a little bit, by by a lot. But when you look at the priority, the priority should be opioid addiction. The okay, the, the yeah, you can make that so, argument. So yeah. I, I guess what I'm saying is, like, look, if it's kind of like with the schools, right? If the teachers were, if kids were graduating, they could read, write, and speak English, yeah. and they could all get into four-year colleges. And you want to talk about global warming? We can have that discussion. Right. You want to talk about gay marriage? We can have that discussion. It's the same thing. If if the Commonwealth was spending its money the way it was supposed to, and we didn't have deficits in areas like no beds for people with opioid addiction, mm. and they wanted to spend this additional money on, on green technology training jobs in Lawrence, which, by the way, there isn't one green technology business in Lawrence, uh, then okay, we can have that discussion, but it's about priorities. And it just seems to me that the state's priority is anything that's abstract that you can't measure, 
racism, all this other stuff, right? Yeah. Black Lives Matter and teaching anti-bullying. Uh, you know, the DA, John Blodgett, spent an inordinate amount of money going to schools and, te- and talking to kids about bullying. Yeah, how does that help? Yeah. Like, wh- tell me one job that created. Well, once again, I think that comes down to an unfunded immunity handed down by Beacon Hill because a couple of years ago, bullying was big. Okay, it was a big issue. And so we passed a bill. I can't remember what it was called, but we basically forced all of our schools to implement this bullying program that we put on. But we didn't give them the money to implement it. We just said, you have to do all this reporting and all these things. And now the superintendents of those schools are saying, well, wait a minute, you're not giving me any money. How am I supposed to do that? Well, maybe in a big city, they have people on the payroll that can handle it. But in a small town, like the ones I represent, they don't have excess people to right. handle that. So we just dump these unfunded mandates on our school superintendents. We do it all the time. Right. That's something that has to be reviewed. And yet, if you ask a Democrat, they'll say, there's no such thing as an unfunded mandate. Like no, how, many times, how many times have they're I heard it's, how many times have I heard a Democrat say on TV there's no such a give me one example my good friend Billy Manzi who I love said to me one day give me one example of an unfunded mandate I'm like, how much time you got yeah like, I list you 35 of them yeah. including special no, I hear you but if, like, if I can go back to something else yes. just so we can close the loop earlier, yes. on, on the funding of this infrastructure bill it's, it's going to be happening I think it's going to happen this year um there is a move afoot to start taxing us by the mile, which scares the oh, bejesus out of me. Absolutely ridiculous. Because you're talking about implementing something that can allows the government to know where you are in your car. Now, if you're a Republican yeah. like yourself, how do you like the idea of someone like, I don't know, Nancy Pelosi knowing where you're going? Right. And if you're a Democrat, how do you like the idea of someone like Donald Trump knowing your whereabouts? Right. Do you really want that? Right. And what I'm saying is – People should fight that tooth and nail, and I hope they do, because like I said, we already have a dozen different taxes for roads and bridges. So let's just look at those. First of all, let's look at where it's all going. Right. And second of all, for Massachusetts, why are we spending so much damn more than all other states? You know, sometimes they'll say, well, it's because New England is a tough area. It's cold. We have bad winters. Well, guess what? Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont are also in New England. They're probably colder than us, and they spend a fraction of what we do. New Hampshire right. – somehow has better roads, better bridges, and they spend a fraction of what we do to repair them. Why is because that? Because the corruption and, in Massachusetts and Beacon Hill. Well, I thought it was corruption too, but I don't think that's where the money's wasted. I don't think that's really? where it is. I, I think it's this. It, it's just the uh, bureaucracy that comes with Massachusetts. Like I said, New Hampshire doesn't require all these police details or DEP reviews. They don't have um, but we need we need police details. You that was the some. third time you mentioned you that. I, I let it go the first two times. But do you need this many? Really. And they have flaggers in New Hampshire. I mean, yeah. on state roads, yeah, it's all state police. You're right. If, if 93 is getting repaired, it's state troopers. Right. Okay, that's true. But the the rules on their police details are a lot looser than ours, and they're allowed to use flaggers. Mm-hmm. And they don't have a DEP that just adds months and years to the permitting of the process too. Right. That's money. Time is money. And, and they See, just but have- I, I call it corruption because I, I believe after watching this for years and years and years that the Democrat Party in Massachusetts, which controls the legislature and has forever, they build in middle layers. If there's going to be a transportation bill, if there's going to be an education bill, whatever yeah. it is, they build in these middle layers where their political donors can get money or contracts to basically do nothing. And that money gets siphoned out at the middle. And then at the end, when you're actually paving the road, they're short money. Like they always come mm-hmm. back, right? They go, oh, we get an overrun of $3 million. Yeah. And nobody asks like the simple question, why? Yeah. Where's the money? And when there's a project that the state votes on, there's never a measure afterwards as to, well, how'd it work? You know, they put a mandate for some kind of an education thing, anti-bullying training. So, okay, they we say we spend, I'll make up a number, $10 million in the state for anti, an anti-bullying mm-hmm. campaign. Do they then go out and measure whether or not fewer kids are getting bullied to see no, whether or not – That's a good question. To see whether yeah. or not that money was well spent so that right. the next time – some fad comes along, some political fad comes along that they're not just wasting money. They don't. I don't see it anyways. Maybe they do, but I don't see it. No. You're probably right. You're yeah. probably right about that. So you have anything else for us? You go, well, no. Thank you for having me on the show. show. I love the news theory. I love what you're doing. I, your show is fast moving. You cover a lot of ground. We do. And, um, you know, I'm we normally, junkie like you. I listen to a lot of talk radio. I watch a lot on TV. And um, this is a good one. You hit on good topics. Thank People you. you had on before me were excellent. Oh, uh, Fred Meredith are the best. Yeah. And I, we actually have two other correspondents. They're not here today. Uh, Ira and Kiana, they always put together some kind of an educational segment. Oh, really? Us. That sounds cool. Uh, Ira's not feeling good, so he couldn't make it. Kiana, she just died. I have no idea. She didn't even call me. Let me know she wasn't coming. So I have no idea. Um, but uh, we're, we're now at two hours. 
Wow. So uh, we're going to be doing more segments, and we're going to, thank God, have longer breaks so I can be more prepared when we come back right. from the break. Okay. But uh, we'd love to have you back. Would you come back? We'd love to come on again. Absolutely. Uh, do, you have a, do you have any competition? You're in election year. I don't know. The papers just came out. Signature papers just came out last Friday. Um, so a state rep has to gather 150 certified signatures to get put on the ballot. And I just That's got it? my papers. And, when um, I ran for school committee, I needed 200. 200? Jeez. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, you need 200 and Well, don't forget, ours, I don't know if the um, municipal nonpartisan, too, you can have anyone sign it. Right. It's a registered voter. Um, I can only get Republicans or unenrolled voters right. to sign my papers. Um, so in Massachusetts, not a lot of Republicans, right. as you know. But we're trying to fix that. And, um, you know, getting back to something you also mentioned earlier on opioids, um, this governor actually has been pretty active in that. And Massachusetts is the first state in the union with a comprehensive plan to address opioids. And it, it, it involves everything from um, how many pills a doctor can prescribe to training our medical people on how to recognize um, signs of addiction because mm-hmm. we're finding out that the gateway drug is not marijuana. People are not going from marijuana to heroin. They're going from prescription drugs to heroin. Yeah, where were you in North? Fentanyl. Where were you in North? The end of a Tuesday night because all we heard was marijuana oh, is a gateway. Drug. No, that's ridiculous. You know, and um, it's 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 painkillers. Some and I think in, in hospitals and doctors' offices, I think when someone goes in for shoulder surgery or something else, they're prescribed a long. Um, a, a big long time of uh, painkillers, mm-hmm. like 30 days worth. Right. So after 30 days of, of taking these things, a lot of people are addicted. they got to fill that void. And apparently heroin is very cheap and Extremely easy to cheap. get. And it's a killer. I think we were burying, geez, correct me if I'm wrong, three or four people every day. Yes. In Ma- just in Massachusetts. Forget the rest of the country. Just Massachusetts. So when we go to bed tonight, four people will be buried. Tomorrow, four more will be buried. That's tragic. Right. That's horrible. I think and the number was, uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, 64,000 people last year died of opioid addiction. Does that wow. sound right? Is that nationwide? Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. That's more than I think died in Vietnam. Rich, you in Vietnam. Is that more than people that died in Vietnam? Yeah, that's more, more than... Yeah, so I mean, wow. and, and 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 what are the priorities of our elected officials? Black Lives Matter, yeah. stopping the wall, global warming, and nobody's paying any attention at the national yeah. level except maybe Trump, and and even I, I think he's kind of dropped the ball a little bit on it. Um, these are our family members. People are saying that, but you know what? What did Trump's predecessor do about it? No, not a thing. All right, so not people saying, oh, he Trump's not doing enough. Actually, he made it worse. He could have, but they're saying Trump isn't spending enough or doing enough. Well, what did his predecessor do about right. it? This, this just didn't happen within the past year. It's right. been going on for a while. Yeah. And I, I think this president has done more. I mean, I, you know, he gets a lot of um, bad treatment. I think he's been very poorly treated by the media. Right. He hasn't been given a fair chance. Um, well, you don't say what you want about him. He does say and do a lot of stupid things. But at the end of the day, I think he's trying to make the comp- country a better place. And he ought to be given a chance. Yeah, There's no. not one news outlet in America that treats him fair. There's not one. Oh, Even Fox, Fox News. No, because Fox had, becomes his cheerleader. Oh, I see. And they'll yeah. never say anything negative about him. So, I mean, they're, they're the outlier. Yeah. But, but if you look at CNN, MSNBC, NBC, CBS, the Boston Globe, the New York Times, they've been the horrible Times, to him. Yeah. I mean, if if Trump if Trump uses his salad fork while he's while he's <laughs> eating his dinner, it's a it's a it's a front page story about you know is that presidential? Is that appropriate? Oh, oh look, he used his salad fork. Let's see what happens if he ever uses Russian dressing on a salad. Oh, I know oh, that. My makes, God, forget it. And think about like at the same time they're saying he's a left wing. Uh, that he, he's a left-wing communist oh, spy for Russia. Right. Yeah. He's also a right-wing fascist Nazi. Yeah. Like in the same sentence, they say it. And people who can't think for themselves or don't know what these concepts mean just go out and they repeat it like it's real. No. Uh, look, I, I'll say it again. We'll close, we'll close the show with this. <laughs> okay. There's nothing that the Democrat Party at the national level believes. I mean, everything that the Democrats at the national level believe is in direct contradiction to everything else that they say they believe in. And the, the, the perfect example that I gave you earlier, I found a better one. So the Democrats and CNN and MSNBC all come out every single day. He's a racist. He hates black people. He hates brown people. Uh, he hates Jews. He's, uh, 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 he's, he's, he, he's evil. And then they unanimously vote to renew the FISA. Oh, yeah. In the Patriot Act, right? So in the Patriot Act... There's a FISA provision that allows the FBI and federal cops under Donald Trump to read your emails, listen to your voicemails, yeah. hack into your computer, turn on the little camera that's on your computer and watch what you're doing while you're at home or at work. And if these people actually believed that he was Hitler, if they really believed that he was a, that he was a fascist or a communist, 
then why would they unanimously vote to give him more power to do fascist and communist things? I think it's because a lot of people simply haven't accepted the election. They just cannot accept the outcome of that election. Right. And they're saying, well, Hillary got more popular votes. And yeah, but she won the election. She should be – you know what? We have rules. We've had the same rules for hundred over 100 years, right? The Electoral college is not something new. And a lot of people simply cannot accept the fact that he won the election. Right. And so they've been apoplectic about it. And they, a lot of people are just not giving him a fair shake. They're right. just not. And we should be looking at what he does and a little bit less on what he says and what he tweets. Right. Look at his actions rather than his words. You brought that up earlier. Yeah. You should be looking at what the guy is doing. And uh, yeah, he stumbled quite a bit out of the gate. But you know what? Maybe he's finding his footing. Maybe he's going to have an infrastructure bill that his predecessor couldn't get passed. Maybe he'll have an opioid bill that his predecessor couldn't get passed. Um, you know, we should be hoping for these things, right? right? Instead I, of hoping for him to fail for election results, you know, we should be hoping for him to succeed. And, and the way he gets criticized, I'm convinced these people have never read history. Because here we are, some maybe 20, 30 years later after, say, Lyndon Johnson, right? Yeah. Do we sit here and talk about the fact that he called black people the N-word? Yeah, no, no we, really, we really don't, right? But we don't talk about it. It's not a big thing that nobody cares about 35 years later. But what we do care is what he did 35 years ago right. that affects our life. You should do a show on that Sunday because you could make the case that just about every president by today's standards could be called a racist. Right. Abraham Lincoln could probably be called right. a huge racist because he never felt that – um, African Americans were equal to whites. He never did. Right. He always felt that they were inferior. But look at what he did. Right. He's the one that ended slavery. Let's look at what he does more than what he says. Right. Because every president has probably said or done something uh, that could be construed as racist by today's standards. Mm -hmm. Right. And so here we are tearing down statues, historical statues, uh, of, because people may have said or done something 200 years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um but, you know, those were different times. And we're uh, look one, at one of the best books I ever read, and I try to plug it as much as I can, it's a book called the, It's a very short book. It's about the size of yours. It's called The Case for Democracy by Natan Sharansky. He was a refusenik. He was a Jew ah. in, uh, in the Soviet Union before the fall. And he used to say, you know, the one thing – uh, in, in a, when you're living under an oppressive communist country, the future is always certain. It's going to be terrible. <laughs> it's the past that's always changing. Right. Because as new leaders come in, they didn't like the last leader and they airbrush them out of pictures. They take them out of the history books and it would be like they never existed. And we're now marching in that direction. I mean, we're tearing down. Uh, listen, as a side note, I don't think there should be one flipping statue to a Confederate in this country. If there's a statue to any Confederate, unless he became president, it should be taken down because they were an enemy army that took up arms against the United States and they were traitors, in my view. That's a good, good not only, argument. Not, not only that, they lost. We, yeah. don't put, we don't put statues up to people who lose wars in this country. At least we shouldn't. However, if they're up now and they're somewhere, move them to a museum. But don't trash them and take them down. You know, don't, no, that's a don't, good point. don't destroy that. And do it in the right way. By the way, some places did do that. They had a vote by the city council, okay, and they went through the proper channels. This is why we have government, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the mayor agrees, the statue comes down, and it goes to a collector or a museum. That's right. how it should be done. Right. It shouldn't be getting vandalized because that, that's the crime too, Todd, right. isn't it? Right. Uh, so, well, we, 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 have, we have our, our uh, social justice uh, warrior institutions that we call colleges now, right? Yeah. That are basically, they're basically left wing Nazi recruiting grounds. Um, and these kids graduate thinking America is just a horrible place because all they hear is all the negative. Yeah, that is tragic. You know, you're I mean, right. And so they're, yeah. they're trying to they're trying to whitewash history, or maybe I don't know, blackwash history. I don't know. Like, I don't. I don't no, it is correct. tragic. It's like they're bl it's to blame America first, right? Crowd, and they are making it sound like America is the only country that was ever settled by invaders. Right. Well, I, there's probably not a country around today that is not inhabited right. by people who invaded it, right. right? And used wars or genocide or whatever to conquer that nation. Mm -hmm. And whether it's England, France, or any country, all of South America, uh, those places were all inhabited by someone else at one time. Right. So why is America the only one that gets crucified for this, for taking the land from the Native Americans? Every land was taken, right. wasn't it? Right. Um, it's and not, not only that, but I mean, the Indians didn't believe man could own land. Correct. Yeah. So you can't take something from someone if they don't even think they own it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, we, 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 in this country, seem to be... Uh, breeding a generation of kids who are learning everything negative about America and nothing positive, and yet they can stand on a corner and call Donald Trump a fascist 
And the very fact that they can stand on a corner and call Donald Trump a fascist is proof that he's not. Mm, right. Because I don't know too many people in Nazi Germany who could stand on a corner and say, down with Hitler, and not be dead five seconds later. I've heard that. The reason you shouldn't burn a flag is because you live in a country where you can right. burn a flag. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but I'm, I'm against a law against burning flags. For that exact reason. Yeah. Because someday. That's what I'm saying. Right. Someday, some despot is going to take over right. our government. And I want the right to burn that flag if I feel as though that's, that's why we have that right. Going. That's why we have the First Amendment. Yeah. But the reason you shouldn't is because you can't. Right. And you shouldn't just because it's wrong. So this is the same reason that, you know, not to change subjects again, uh, the whole Colin Kaepernick thing. Yeah. He's allowed to take a knee during the national anthem or whatever. Um, no one arrested him. Right. He has the right to do that, but we have the right to call him out for it too, don't we? So, you know, the First Amendment goes both ways. Yeah, it does. Uh, all right, Lenny Miller, do you have anything else you want to promote? No, just book, thank you for having me on the talk show. Talk about your book. Where can they get it? It's on Amazon right now. It's called Boston Sort of Legal, and it's written by me, Lenny Miller, and my good, our good friend, our Timothy Imholt. All right. Excellent. And uh, my book, uh, Heroes in Our Midst, from the pages of the Valley Patriot. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. I would prefer that you buy it off me at the office. We make more money that way, and the money <laughs> and the money goes to veterans too. So we give money to veterans Northeast Outreach from some of the proceeds we get from the book. The TV commercial is uh, Valley Patriot TV commercial is running now. Actually, somebody just texted me and said they saw the commercial on uh, on uh, the NFL channel. So we're running on all the sports channels today, tomorrow. Uh, what's today? Two Thursday. Today, tomorrow, Saturday, and then we we couldn't afford fifty eight million dollars for Sunday, uh, but we do have commercials running for the after uh, oh, all right. for Monday for when they're doing the wrap up of the of the Super Bowl or the big game. I don't want to get sued by the NFL by saying Super Bowl. Um, what else do we have? We want to thank Twin Lights Security. They provide my security. They also do investigations. So if you're going through a divorce, if you run a company and you think someone might be stealing from you, you can hire them. They'll come in. They'll investigate. Caruso and Caruso, attorneys at law in Andover, a and Auto Body. Go see Angelo. If you've got a problem with your car, tell him that you saw this. Tell him that you're a fan of the Valley Patriot. Angelo will take care of you. I've already had several conversations with him about it. Joe Zingales, Joe and Rosanna Zingales at uh, Century 21 in Methuen. Team Zingales, EIS Security. Uh, who do we forget? Oh, next week, Jeff Riley, who is the superintendent receiver of the Lawrence Public Schools, uh, and at the end of his bout, at the end of the school year, becomes the commissioner of education for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So he's going to come in tomorrow as he leaves his job in Lawrence and takes the job as the head of the State Department of Ed. I think he's going to have a lot of stuff to say that he couldn't say when he was just the superintendent and looking to get his contract renewed. So don't miss that next week. Uh, we want to thank Dave LaCroix, who's here, uh, who came to be part of our studio audience. Dave and I were sitting at um, Sal's, Sal's uh, Salvatore's restaurant one day at the bar, and I was having computer problems. And, um, you know, everything I do is on the computer. And I lost <laughs> okay. like five years worth of work on my laptop. <laughs> and I brought it to nice. five different people and they couldn't get the data off of it. It was a totally corrupt drive. And Dave said to me, I've got a guy. I've got a guy. I said, yeah, everybody's got a guy. I've gone to everybody's guy and nobody can get it. He said, no, no, no. You need to go see Mr. Lowe at Jasmine's Computer Service. They're not a sponsor, but I'm going to give him a free plug anyway. Wow. Go see Mr. Lowe at Jasmine's Computer Service. I promise you, if he can't get it, Nobody can get it. Mr. Lowe got me 93% of my data wow. back. I only lost 7% of my data. Uh, and they're right here on 28 in Salem, New Hampshire. And I found out afterwards, thank you, Dave, for, for recommending him. Found out afterwards he's a Gold Star father. They're a Gold Star family. Oh, wow. And they lost their son uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, so we bring them to the bash every year. And we honor them as a Gold Star family. And they have a scholarship uh, event that they run every year. We try to go to that. Uh, what do we have left? I'm just trying to – I'm stalling for time. I want to make sure I don't forget anybody today. I forgot a few people last. Jessica Finicaro is having a fundraiser tonight. If you're watching us live on Thursday, February 1st uh, at the VFW in Methuen at 6 o'clock, I'm going to be there. I would encourage you to please come. She's got a little bit of a war going on in Methuen, and she could use some help. Uh, and so I'm going to be there to help her, and I hope my friends will be there to help her. Uh, Lenny Mira, thank you so much for coming thank you in. To, and thank you for all you do for veterans, by the way. It doesn't get said enough, and um, I'm glad you do it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, someone's got to take care of our veterans, and if I can inspire other people to help out those guys, then I feel like my job is done. Right. Stu Fink, our fine, fine producer who produced the show today. Uh, Rich Russell, our photographer who's here. Mike Thibodeau from... Um, from uh, Twin Light Security, our friend Ron Charette dropped in with us. Sean the Barista with my amazing coffee with his purple hair. Listen, you guys should come to Two Guys Smoke Shop just for the coffee. 
Honestly, it's literally the best coffee I've ever had. It's from Brazil. Oh, and the bash. We have our annual charity bash, March 23rd. We're giving awards to police officers, firefighters, and veterans. We're giving out scholarships to kids at Lawrence High School, the Volk, uh, North Andover High School, and I think even Methuen. Uh, Lenny, thank you so much. I thank appreciate you, you coming in. I appreciate everybody for being here. We will see you next week with Jeff Riley, and I'll have these segments up shortly. Good job. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.